Um, so I'm not going to do that as well. Uh, the members of consent will be pr proceeding through the agenda. Uh, just before we do that, I want to make some opening remarks. Um, and I think this is quite important, bearing in mind what's been going on today. Uh, in opening today's committee, I would wish to make clear to the committee members that we have significant areas of work today and vital areas are particularly rates on standard rules and the issues we have with NICFA as well. However, as the chairman of this committee, it would be remiss of me not to note the brave words of Breach Quinn today uh -huh. and the failure of our finance minister either public apologise on television or as requested to go to the PSNI or the Garda Shakona and convey such information that he has and the impact that this has had and the confidence in our democratic institutions. Now, bearing in mind the important work we've got to do it today, it would, I believe, be appropriate to discuss this issue, if it, the issue later if it wishes to be raised in AOB. That's a comment I would wish to make. Any comments? Well, I agree it's imperative it's raised because we had the same minister sitting here last week telling us about he was drafting codes of conduct for others and then we discover that by his actions and inactions over recent years, he, he has behaved as he did, confirming my view that he's utterly unfit for office, but I think, yes, we should return to it. Okay. Yes, I, I would concur with that and concur with your comments, Mr Chairman. Okay. okay if we move on, apologies. Receive your honour apology from Matthew O'Toole. Matthew. Correct. Uh, I would like to remind members that they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interests at each committee meeting as applicable. As chairman, I want to declare an interest as the MLA for South Antrim. Obviously, we have significant issues with rates, particularly in the South Antrim area, and particularly to do with Belfast International Airport. So I may be raising that through the conversation and discussions today, but I wish to raise that. Pat? And the same for my constituency in Lagan Valley. I think it would probably follow for all of us if we mention rates in this on today. In addition to the rates issue, which concerns us all, uh, could I declare an interest in respect of item 21? Well, you have correspondence from me about my private members, but... Okay. Right, uh, look at the draft minutes of the proceedings of the 29th of January. Uh, the draft minutes of the meeting are on page 6. Members, are we content with the draft minutes? Are an accurate record of proceedings? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Any against? Oh. Can we publish those on the website, please? Uh, there were no matters arising. So, uh, we're now moving on to an overview of the of and priorities of the Land and Property Service. I just want to remind you that this item is being recorded by Hansard. And what I'd like to welcome Ian Snowden, Chief Executive of Land and Property Services, and Alan Bronte, Director of the Rating Policy Division. Uh, they will be in attendance and will provide the committee with an overview of Land and Property Services and its priorities and will also provide an update on rating legislation progressing since 2017. I'd like to draw the members' attention to a briefing paper from the committee clerk, which is page 16, and thank you very much indeed for that. It's particularly comprehensive. And a briefing from the department regarding key issues and priorities for the LPS, which is at page 19. I'd like to draw members' attention to the written briefing papers from business representatives that we've requested on the non-domestic rate, and they're from page 36 onwards and are quite extensive. Uh, we've received the following briefings that have included those on pages 36 to 252 from the CBI, FSB Northern Ireland, Hospitality Ulster, Manufacturing NI, NICFA, NI Retail Consortium, Retail NI, and a report received from two East Antrim business people at their meeting on the 29th of January 2020. Ian, thank you. Would you be able to reach Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, you've obviously received a written briefing that we... Um, we submitted. Um, I'll just give a quick overview of what um, Land and Property Services is uh, and then a few issues around what we have um, been doing since 2017 and then some um, more immediate issues looking forward over the next um, 6 to 12 months. So Land and Property Services is um, a division of the Department of Finance that was formed around 2008 by the amalgamation of four previous separate agencies, the Valuation Lands Agency, um, Rate Collection Agency, Ordnance Survey and Land Registers. Um, more laterally, we have um, added on Rate and Policy Division from January of last year. Um, the activity of Land and Property Service is really a mixture of some steady state activity, which um, sort of continues without much change, mostly in Ordnance Survey and Land Registry. 
where those services continue to be delivered uh, in much the same fashion year on year. Um, some cyclical or periodic kind of activity, which would be in the rates billing and collection cycle, um, and then a slightly more um, distant time frames um, revaluation of non-domestic rates, um, and then there are one-off or episodic kind of activities <coughs> and things like policy reviews, um, and we're also going through a fairly substantial digital transformation program in land and property services at the minute. Uh, a number of those issues are covered in the, in the briefing material. Um, since 2017, um, I suppose the committee will be interested in some of the um, key issues that have been going on in land and property services since the Assembly last sat. Um, on uh, rate setting and the regional rate, um, you will of course be getting a much more detailed briefing of the statutory rules which were passed in the, in the past three years in uh, relation to the setting of the regional rate. Um, in the absence of the Assembly, the regional rate was set by the Westminster Parliament as part of the budget setting process in each of the past three financial years. Um, and that has been more or less the extent of the um, legislative activity at Westminster in relation to what um, is happening in the rating field. Um, rates performance has been generally quite good in terms of collection and rating debt. Um, you'll see that collection figures have gone up. Our rating uh, collection performance has, has increased and debt has now been brought down to its lowest level in over a decade. Um, the previous two finance ministers, Mervyn Storey, and Marcin and Miller agreed that there should be a non-domestic revaluation exercise carried out, and LPS has been taking that forward in the intervening period. Um, no doubt there will be questions relating to that later on in the session. Um, the schedule of draft, the draft sh schedule of draft values was published on the 7th of January of this year, just before the Assembly returned. Um, in May of last year, the Permanent Secretary announced a review of business rates. Um, Mr Bronte will be able to talk in more detail about that. He has been leading on that for us since that review was announced. And in January of last year, the Civil Service Board agreed to a project to establish a single mapped database of all land and property owned by the public sector in Northern Ireland, um, which is going by the provisional title still of the Government Land and Property Register. I'm happy to talk to you about what that involves, if, if you wish, um, but that's a project which is ongoing and probably take about three years to complete in its entirety. Looking ahead over the next um, short period, um, obviously the 2020-2021 rate cycle uh, is key for us at the minute uh, in preparation for that. That includes the setting of the regional rate to allow the rate bill to be calculated and issued um, with the intention of getting bills out at the start of April as normal. Um, this year, the revaluation exercise will continue. We have an informal period now where we appear to be able to contact LPS and challenge or query their draft valuations um, before the bills are calculated. Um, Just as a matter of, Ian, how much is how much uh, challenging are you getting at the moment? We've had between two and three hundred phone calls out of fifty-five or fifty-six thousand people who have paid bills. So quite a small number, really. Um, so that, that work will continue. Whenever the um, full list is published on the 1st of April of this year, then that will be um, subject to the statutory process for applications, appeals, and uh, potentially challenges to the Lands Tribunal. Um, the rates policy review um, will, will continue. We'll be in discussions with the Minister, now that he is in post, to. Uh, to present a number and discuss a number of options for short, medium and long-term measures that might be taken. Um, and we will be progressing with our digital transformation programme. And by June or July of this year, we should be letting the first contract for the replacement of the rate collection system, which is known as Avix. So that's as much as I want to say by way of introduction. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on any of the stuff that's in the briefing material or any other issue mm -hmm. to the okay. Um, I'm going to start off with a couple of ones. Um, look, you'll be aware that there's a considerable degree of disquiet being expressed by the many small and medium businesses that we've had. And I was interested when you said you only had two to three hundred sort of telephone inquiries about what's been going on from the draft process. Um, Must give them your number. Yeah. I don't think any MLA here has had has not had a direct representation from businesses and their constituencies, and I'm actually very surprised at the two to three hundred figure. I think I've had as many as that in South Antrim alone. 
And, uh, you know, to quote from a briefing we received from the CBI, you know, however, for many of our members, particularly in the services and hospitality sectors, the feeling is very much that they've been treated unfairly throughout, throughout this process. Without due warning, they may have had to absorb substantial increases that are materially, materially damaging. Indeed, we've had reports between 31% to 60% increase in potential rate increases in some areas. Um, can you tell me about how these demands have come about, how you've been communicating them since they only found out about them in January, and why has there been no attempt at upwards transitional relief as we have in the rest of the United Kingdom? And so what, could you run me through those sort of particular issues to do that as well? Yeah, sure. The, um, the revaluation exercise is designed to introduce fairness in the railing system. So essentially, um, as the property market moves and changes in values and property, um, go up or down, then the periodic revaluation exercises will bring the rateable values of the properties in line with what the rental value in the marketplace are for most kinds of property, um, which are part of a normal rental market, for example, offices and shops. There will be information about market um, activity, rents let and past, um, that you can use as a basis for calculating the rental value for the property. For other kinds of property, um, there, there's never any um, renting of those kinds, um, so that would be the likes of airports or hospitals, schools, that kind of thing. So a, a methodology there is called a structures cost method. You work out what it would cost to build the premises, you uh, depreciate that by the age of the premise, and then you work out using an applied decapitation rate, which is in legislation. Um, to Sorry, just going to look at what you said about airports and hospitals, you had no data? Well, there's no rental market for either of those two types of property in Northern Ireland, so nobody rents a hospital, nobody rents an airport. So, but you were able to take those directly from what was happening in the rest of the country, obviously? Uh, no, no. Uh, Mr. Bronte is the expert in this, and he can explain if he wants um, in more detail. But essentially, for those kinds of properties, you work out how much it costs to build it. So if you were attempting to rent, build a airport to rent it, or a hospital to rent it, um, you would work out how much it would cost you to rent or to build, and then you would work out how much rent you would need to take in order to make that a profitable property investment. So what the constructor's methodology attempts to do is work back from how much it would cost to build the premises and then work, work out what the rentable value, rentable value of the property would be. But, I mean, just an just example of the airport. I mean, it's taken you five years to come out with whatever the valuation is. And that was taken to the Lands Tribunal and it was lost. And we're going back again to the Lands Tribunal, I understand to do exactly the same thing again. So what, 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 why is it taking five years for this process to go through when you know we've got data from England, Scotland and Wales that you could be using? I might be just a gut. Um, yeah, so there's construction costs, which um, in, in terms of the current valuation for the, for the airport minute, we have taken that data. That data is agreed uh, by the airport users group for, for airports throughout the UK. Um, and so we have used the construction costs that uh, have been agreed by the airport users and adjusted it for Northern Ireland and adjusted it slightly for the different valuation dates in Northern Ireland. And so in relation to the international airport in the current list, um, everything is agreed in terms of construction, in terms of <coughs> depreciation, in terms of the size, the site, everything. There's one item that's not agreed, and that's at the minute, uh, is being taken forward by two sets of experts between the airport and experts appointed by LPS. And that is looking at this issue called superfluidity. superfluidity yeah. um, and so the valuers on both sides have agreed absolutely everything, and that is sitting, and that, that has been the case. But experts are now in discussion uh, in relation to superfluidity, and how do they, how can we reflect uh, the what the airport is describing is under usage of their of their building, and how does that under usage find its way back into the value? Um, and so that is the outstanding issue, and, and the experts are, 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 and I'm I think from talking to the valuation side, I'm very confident that I, I can see that being agreed and not going to the Lands Tribunal. Uh, but there are different issues now than there were back. We were dealing with the 2003 valuation previously. We're dealing with the a 2015 valuation now, passenger numbers are different, but, but everything is agreed to um, bar this one item of superfluity, um, and, and I think that's, it's moving along now, uh, 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 I'm really confident we should be able to get that agreed. Mm -hmm. And how much money do we have to give back to the airport? 
I, I, I don't so about three million pounds. But it depends where the where the valuation settles. In the previous settlement. Oh, previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, probably around that. About three million. Pounds. Yeah, but that was that was uh, yeah, going back quite a number of years. So, so it, I mean, yes. So the the, con the contractor's method is uh, not something that LPS have. It's it's an accepted methodology, right across the valuation profession, uh, and signed off by the RICS and IRV and professional bodies. Uh, so it's something that uh, that we use that other rating authorities or rating values <coughs> authorities throughout the UK use. Um, and the, the Is there similar problems throughout the rest of the UK with, this, with these issues? Because I understand it's not just with the airport, there's all sorts of issues with shopping centres and all sorts of things that are being challenged. Through the there, there are always issues and, and I think you'll find that uh, if you look into the valuation office uh, records you'll find that they will have appeals going back. Um, not just into current valuationists to the previous valuationists. These things are, are contentious. Um, certainly in terms of the values now, there are very few cases. There are less than 100 challenges left in the current valuation list. Um, now, that's, that's a big success in a sense of, of, of the number of cases that are there. And that, those are going down by the week. Um, so we don't have, an uh, LPS, we do not have a, a sort of legacy now of, of long, outstanding challenge cases. Yes, there will be one or two cases that are, are, are more highlighted, uh, such as the airport, but generally speaking, um, LPS valuation are very much on top of their caseload, um, and uh, I, I would expect you know, that to be So, so just how do we benchmark uh, LPS in Northern Ireland against uh, other land and property services across the rest of the country? In, in what respect? In, in the amount of sort of challenges you have and uh, the speed with which it comes to making valuations, where would you put yourself? Well, in terms of the challenge, well, other people have put us uh, at, a, at a fairly high level, um, and, and that's, uh, there, there are other people who have referenced that. But in terms of the challenge rate, in Northern Ireland we have quite a low challenge rate. So against the 2015 rate, about 7% of valuations were challenged. Uh, historically, in is that something to do with the fact that there's a different legal system in Northern Ireland where you you will have to put a substantial amount of money up to take it to the land tribunal? No, because the first two stages in Northern Ireland are entirely free, so there is no cost uh, in terms of an application. So, the stage to the district value or to the commissioner are two stages in Northern Ireland where there is no application fee. Um, and the land tribunal certainly yes, but that's no different than in fact other parts. Uh, if you were going to the higher courts in, in England, it would be, it'd be more expensive. But in terms of the challenge, the 7% challenge is, 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 is out there in terms of some of the best. And I think that we attribute to the past to the consultation that has gone on before a revaluation and uh, the attempt to, uh, to agree certain values in, in advance of a revaluation. Um, at, at some stages in GB, the appeal rate has been 50% plus. Uh, that's a massive workload, um, and I'm really glad that we don't have uh, that sort of reaction. So I think even in 2015, after a period of 12 years, um, I think they might have worked in the consultation, the work that we did at that, around that time, um, had left to a very low challenge rate, and, and those challenges have all been cleared. Uh, the first year challenges were all cleared uh, in sort of 18 months to year. <coughs> Ian, just another question. Uh, sort of, um what should be your staffing complement? How many people should you have in LPS? Because there's been a lot of amalgamations and groups bought in and sort of changes. How many people? 118. Sorry, it's 1,118. And how many have you got? 939. Is that a significant problem? Yes. And do you think you're fit for purpose? Um, I think we're managing to cope with the business. The, the difficulty is there's no capacity to take on additional workload. So. Um, with no disrespect to yourself, <coughs> obviously, um, the return of the Assembly has put a tremendous amount of pressure on the organisation, which was able to cope simply because the normal machinery and government business didn't have to be done. So mm. my Could you elaborate on that? Well, my number of emails has doubled since... Yeah, but you never answered them beforehand, so what's the difference? Let's <laughs> <laughs> try the best. Um, so the number of emails... No, you didn't. Yeah, that's, the volume of workload comes, you know, it, it, it does substantially increase for all parts of the organisation. Um, if we want to make any changes or improvements, it simply isn't the resource there to allocate to that task. Okay. 
Oh, yeah, I haven't actually quite finished your question about the CBI stuff. Yeah. Okay. So then, as well as constructors, uh, construction method of valuation, there's also the receipts and expenditure valuations. Mm -hmm. so this is the one that's the most biggest component of contention for pubs and hotels. So in other kinds of properties where there's a limited amount of movement in terms of rental of properties, um, you have to find um, a method by which you can make an assessment of what the rental value would be. Um, if you wanted to rent a pub, the thing that you would look at was how much business the pub was doing, because that would then determine how much rent you'd be willing to pay for the pub. So that is the method by which uh, essentially, the valuation for a pub or a hotel is worked out. It's on the basis of the receipts, the amount of business that they take in, and then their expenditures, the, the amount of costs they've got. Um, and you can pull that data from HMRC, can't you? Um, we can pull it from Companies House, accounts, and from various different sources. Really, the business owners should give it to us. They have a statutory requirement under the law to do it. Um, and the <coughs> returns for hotels was very low. Uh, return for pubs is about 33%. So if the Business premises don't provide you with the information, then you'll have to source it from other other sources. What about the trade bodies themselves? I mean, sort of things like um, Hospitality Ulster or any of the they can they not provide you with data? Um, well, because um, I, I mean, I would imagine sort of pubs and hotels over a particular size. And I, I don't know. Uh, sorry, I know you'll come into this uh, later, but I just want to get this. Okay, the um, we have engaged quite a number of times with Hospitality Ulster. Um, in Great Britain, the <coughs> equivalent bodies over there um, have agreed a scheme of valuation with um, the Valuation Office and the Scottish Assessment um, people. Now, um, in Northern Ireland, Hospitality Ulster has not agreed the valuation scheme, others they won't engage to agree a valuation scheme for, for pubs. Um, so the valuation scheme that we use is not one that's been agreed with them. Um, now, it shouldn't take from that that it is detrimental to pubs here. In fact, the percentages used in that valuation scheme would be more generous than they would be um, in Scotland or England. Um, and indeed, just after Christmas, there was um, um, an article from some Scottish um, licensed trade organisations complaining vigorously that if our methodology was used, then their valuations would be about 50% lower. Um, but that le level of engagement has been quite disappointing. Um, it is reported to us and rumoured that um, Hospitality Ulster is telling... But we don't do rumour here. We do just fact. OK. Well, I can't verify this, um, and Mr Neil would deny it, but it is, it is, has been said to us by some people that they are telling pub owners not to, uh, not to engage and not to send in information, which is disappointing if it's true. Now, if any of you have got constituents who have got concerns and they've come about revaluation, re um, they really should be getting in contact with us. We want them to get in contact. If we are able to deal with problems before the valuation list takes effect on the 1st of April, um, then the number of appeals and applications will be reduced substantially and everybody will be in a much happier position. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Oh, I, can I just, oh, sorry. Sorry. I just no. add, add to what Ian has said to you? Because uh, there is a lot of misunderstanding um, that in some way the rating system in Northern Ireland is using a completely different system for pubs and hotels than other properties. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth um, in that every single property in Northern Ireland under statute is valued on its rental value. And as Ian has described, how we, how we get to rental value for like the airport, um, it's a rental value. It's the only thing that we can put into the valuation list. It's how you get to that rental value. But there is no different approach taken. So it's the rent of the pub, it's the rent of the hotel. Um, and there are other types of properties like cinemas and markets and petrol filling stations, mm -hmm. quarries, utilities, in which we use the receipts and expenditure method of valuation. And so I would really want to put on the record that the system for valuing pubs or hotels in Northern Ireland is no different. It's a rental value. Valuers can argue as to whether the rental value assessed is correct, uh, but it is the same basis, and so there is no different basis. And so because we're asked for turnover, we, we, we're looking for throughput in petrol filling stations, we're looking for a tonnage of quarry uh, through a quarry and many other properties, and so it is a way of just getting to rental value. Um, and, and if they do not accept the rental value, um, then there is, there is a process of going, as we talked earlier about the Lands Tribunal, if we go to the Lands Tribunal, the Lands Tribunal will be looking at a receipts expenditure basis of valuation in order to achieve a rental value under the statute. So I really do want to put on record because there's a lot of false information here that LPS in some way are, are, are making, are, are tackling the issue of rates of pubs in a very different way. We're not.
Well, we'll have the opportunity, the trade associations, yep. to be able to tell us themselves and, and when they come and talk to us. And as Ian has said, it's exactly the same methodology throughout the UK and indeed the Republic of Ireland. Okay. Sir, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, if William Pitt came in says, Ian, Alan, I've got a problem. We're going to have to fight the French and it may last a generation. With no money in the Exchequer, how do we raise money? What ideas would you have? And would it be something similar to this? Be into the end of the story. And so, uh, I hadn't planned for that question for me. <laughs> 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 Must have been. That's fine. It's an unusual one. Yep. <laughs> Despite the rumour, I wasn't no. around. Um, <laughs> suppose what I'm asking is: Is Actually, you guys work this every day? So is this the best way to raise revenue? Is it the fairest way? Raise revenue. I'll, I'll, I'll have a go at it, Ian, while okay, um, yeah. you're, you're thinking. In, in, in most, most jurisdictions uh, will have a property tax system in their basket of taxes. Um, and so, um, if no matter really where you go, if you go to the you know, go to US, you go to Canada, you go to uh, the rest of the islands, uh, you, you, most people will have in that basket a property tax. Um, and they will have transactional taxes, they will have capital taxes, corporation taxes. There are a range of taxes that, that most com countries will have. And in there somewhere will be a, a property tax that's probably a local tax uh, to fund local services. And there are good reasons why you should have property tax because it's predictable, it's very difficult to escape. Uh, and it's quite it's quite quite easy to predict as well what you, what you're going to get from it, um, and I think therefore um, there is a place for a property tax in, in most jurisdictions. It's where the balance is is the issue. Does it ignore means to pay? Does, does it ignore ask cash flow? Is it blind it to that? Because you could end up owning something or or renting something substantial, but but not have the means and the business to pay? No, nor, normally, uh, worth value, value, whether it be rental value or capital value, is normally quite closely aligned to, to ability to pay. There are always serious situations. For example, one that I remember talking to this committee back in 2007 about was whenever the, whenever the domestic revaluation changed the basis so that you can have a, a uh, retired individual, now widower, widower, in a large house. Uh, and, and therefore, there is a difficulty there with the value of the property and their ability to pay because it's inherent. And so, so there are always exceptions. But I think, generally speaking, uh, no matter where you go, if you rent the shop, um, then you've taken that rent on that shop and, and you expect to be then taxed uh, in terms of business rates. I think the issue that we have in Northern Ireland, and we could come back to this, is the level of that percentage against the rental value. But I think there is a good correlation between value and ability to pay, but there are always the exceptions. Um, Ian, over there. Yeah, um the benefit of a property tax is that the property tax is visible. You can see it. It's very difficult to hide. Um, property taxation system based on rental values also promotes efficient use of the space. So if you are operating a kind of business which is not making very much money, um, then it encourages different forms of business activity or you move to a location which is more suitable. Um, now, that causes difficulties for the individuals involved, but over, over a longer span, so you talk about you're going to be fighting the French for a generation, you'd want to have efficient economic activity in your um, in your economy over that period of time and one way that that has helped is through property taxes. Um, it's a slightly different question though if you say um, would you have designed with a blank piece of paper the current business rating system with its range of exemptions and reliefs and exclusions. Um, I'm not sure that is the same answer, although that's that an accretion of a number of decisions taken over a long number of time. Does that not, does, does that not illustrate, though, the primitive and blunt tool that this property tax is when we're having to give exemptions to industrial day rating, which is which I support, of course, and there's there's mythology around that. Uh, but does that not show the primitive and blunt instrument that it is? I think certainly um, if you have a tax, the, the, the more exemptions and the reliefs that you have to give to make it workable. 
uh, then it calls into question whether you've got the basic facts correct. Um, I, I think in Northern Ireland we don't have the, um, we haven't had to have the range of reliefs and exemptions perhaps that I've seen in other, in other jurisdictions. Um, certainly from the domestic point of view, um, uh, they're very few and far between. And, uh, and that's, so it, so I, I, think, I think at one extreme, yes, it's not fit for purpose. Uh, but I think that, um, I think, and, and, and the Republic of Ireland was a case in point where um, uh, quite a number of years ago they dropped having a residential property tax mm -hmm. um, and, and when they hit economically bad times yep. when transactional tax did no longer work um, the part of the rescue deal was to reinstate a residential property tax and they've had to do that and had to do it very quickly mm -hmm. they looked at what we were doing in Northern Ireland and the quickest way to do that was a, uh, was a self-assessment tax into a banded system uh, but it's it's quite low take still, um, and it has it's going to have to move in some direction. So I think every jurisdiction will have some form of re residential and commercial property based tax. There's lots of nuances in there, but generally speaking, I think it's a good thing. Can I ask then about the rates collection? Because it's one thing charging someone for it is getting the money off them, and then it's, there's a fairness element to the people who do pay and the people who don't. Um, now. We did say that you know there seemed to be in your correspondence a positive slant on the fact uh, that debt has fallen to its lowest levels for a decade, standing at one hundred and twenty-four billion. Mm -hmm. Now that's that's we could we could do a lot with one hundred and twenty-four million. Well, maybe we couldn't. Maybe we could spend it badly, but at least it would be useful to have. So so where where. Where are we on that? What's the rationale and reason why we are at that levels? I know it's historical, but, but what mechanisms are in place to get that money back, or is it simply just court case after court case? Well, the majority of the 124 million at the end of last year, um, probably more accurately described as arrears. So the vast majority of that will be um, rates not yet paid, but which is some sort of payment arrangement. Um, so uh, it's not that at the end of a year we have failed to collect £124 million and then next year, so that's gone and it's lost forever, and then next year this is a kind of a rolling figure. Um, every year there's a certain amount of debt has to be written off because principally it's in, in non-domestic business rates and um, the companies involved will have gone into liquidation. So there will always be a certain degree of, of debt which you, you know, you'll never be able to recover. And how, what figure can you put on that on a yearly basis? Uh, Is there... Last year it was 18 million. 18 million. Yeah, and that's declined quite substantially over the past five years from closer to yeah. about 35. Could you attribute the drop in that dropping off? Um, are we saying that we're? Are we saying no, that? No, actually, you, uh, the other way around. I mean, if I wanted to be really cynical, and I wanted to push that debt figure down below 100 million pounds. I would just wipe right off a yes. large chunk of debt, um, and it might not be all that terribly transparent that that's what's happened. Um, so, in fact, by reducing the amount that's written off every year, um, we are actually it demonstrates that in addition, we are obviously bringing more in of the collectible rates in each year, and that's really what we need to be trying to do. Um, what's happened in the past? Um, three to four years is there's been a new approach to actually analysing the, the debt and use of data um, where the, the debtors are segmented so we're into different types so um, um, obviously domestic and non-domestic repairs are slightly different beha debtor behaviours are slightly different and so forth and we've put quite a lot of investment in the help of people the who are in financial difficulties yeah. and actually getting payment arrangements put in place um, so some of that debt of £124 million pounds would be in relation to people we have agreed three or four year payment re-periods on. Yeah. So it may be a number of years before all of that, that uh, outstanding debt and raise is brought in. But I think there's at least an assurance that the money is going to be brought in and it will come in. Um, if you don't get the money in that payment arrangement or the payment arrangement is broken, uh, then you will consider court action. Um, and that will be usually through the Enforcement and Judgments Office, and if that's not successful, then there will be bankruptcy proceedings will be started. And typically, I think there are about 25,000 court proceeding letters issued each year. Um, the issuing of those letters is usually sufficient to get the payment in, uh, and there are a class of rate pairs, smallish in number, but you know, significant enough, who um, wait every year until that process has started and will quite often turn up at the court with a cheque and pay then. 
So uh, there's a kind of a process to go through with some of those some of those rate pairs. Um, there's a chunk of debt which is more difficult to collect because um, rating debt is a civil issue in Northern Ireland. It is not a criminal offence not to pay your rates, so we have to take civil court proceedings in order to recover it. If the rate payer is not resident in Northern Ireland, so if they live in another part of the United Kingdom or in the Republic of Ireland, then we can't pursue them legally through the courts to get it. So we've taken a look at other methodologies to try and get those people to um, to pay up. Um, one that's been quite successful is the use of Stubbs Gazette as a kind of a, a recovery method. So the the um, the reputational damage of having your name in Stubbs Gazette still carries a certain amount of weight, um, and so people when Stubbs get in contact with them, will then pay. So that has been quite successful in bringing more debt in. So all these things together have helped push the rate and debt down. Can you give us a breakdown of the 124 million uh, between business, between non-domestic and domestic, and else also can that be broken down by area, geographical area? It's about two thirds non-domestic, one third domestic. I think off the top of my head, I can't tell you the precise figures, but it's roughly around that um, by area. Um, I could give it for you, yeah, certainly, and a breakdown of the age of the debt and so forth. Yeah, that would be useful. Uh, break probably in constituencies, but that is that the way it would break down? Um, usually by district council. District area, council, but um, it might be more difficult, take longer to get it sorted out. Make it such a No, useful. no, whatever way, whatever methodology is used. <coughs> it's fine. It's fine. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks very much, Mike. Uh, Jim Allister. Yeah, uh, just walk me through, if you would, basic um, arithmetic formula for working out the, Nash, uh, the NAV. It's linked to the perceived rental value. Yes? Mm -hmm. And is there a multiplier there, or how do you get to it? In, in, in carrying out a rating assessment, uh, as its colliers will take exactly the same approach as they will if they wanted to rent in the open market. So in terms of carrying out a rating assessment, um, was the valuers will use the terminology that they follow the market. So the analysis of, uh, of the shops in, in, a, in a particular street, will, will have, they'll have analysed the market, they'll have analysed the rents around the valuation date. They can, so the valuation date for this current revaluation is 2018, that's one of the SRs uh, on, on the table today. So that valuation date is the 1st of April 2018. And so the valuer will try to adjust the analysis forward or back to, to correspond with the valuation date, but you're following the market. So if we're talking about shops, offices, warehouses, factories, you're looking at the open market rental value. The statutory definition is that uh, there, there is a definition of the rental value. It's one year with another, and it talks about a, a willing lessor and a willing lessee. Um, so is that per square meter? No, it's no, it's a, it's you're analysing the rent, and as you as you devalue social you value so so having valued devalued the rent of that shop which was fifty thousand you start to understand you can you can analyze it different ways you could you would zone it if it's a shop you will take an overall if it's a supermarket but we follow the market and so having analyzed the market and understand the rental value market of that street then you will use that market evidence to then uh, apply that devaluation to every shop in the street as if you were going to rent every shop in the street. So not all shops obviously as we know are some of them are owner occupied there will be no there will be no rental evidence there but we have to put a rent in every shop. Uh, so we're using So if you market. say that shop there is worth six thousand pounds a year, how does that translate into the NAV? Well if, if the shop was let on the first of April twenty eighteen at six thousand pounds per annum, yes. I would expect to see I would, I would want to understand why the NAV wasn't six thousand pounds per, uh, you know, six, why the NAV wasn't six thousand pounds, because if it's around about the valuation date and we know that it was a, an arm's length transaction, we would expect to see the rental value, open market rental value, and the NAV being very close to the same thing. And do you think it is? Well, it should be. Yeah. And where it isn't. And where it isn't, then you would want to know why it isn't. And well, can you tell me why in Baba Money, for example, it's so out of kilter? Well, I, I'm not sure. You know, until we, until we know the actual property. But if you if you look at the if you look at the rents for the shop, you might understand if it was connected parties or if it was an open market rental value. But no, you would expect to see a correlation, a very close correlation, because the market has been analysed and then applied by the value. What's the, what's this phrase? Rental tone. So a rental tone would be 
Um, if you have a street, uh, rents will be negotiated at different times, and some people might have, uh, a, you know, struck a harder bargain than others. And, and the point here is about, uh, in, in terms of NEV terms, you want to try to provide a tone so that you, you have a, a general level of values applied where, where the location and the type of property is the same. Um, and so if you have three shops together and, and they are the same, uh, you, would try to, you, would, you would expect to have the same mm -hmm. readable value. In and does shop. the rental tone translate into a pound each per square metre? No, there's no. The, the valuer will analyse the shops in the street or the offices, and they will come up with the pricing. Yes, you see, Mr. Bundy, I have the, uh, estate agents in Baba Money who have said to me that in Baba Money Town, the tone of the town centre is being worked out by the valuation office at £180 per square metre, which is nowhere close to what's actually attainable in the market. Mm -hmm. You're doing well if you get £120 a square metre. Mm -hmm. So how is it that in streets in Bama Money, you have worked out an NAV on the basis of £180 a square metre when you couldn't possibly acquire that in rent? Well, that's something then that where, where individuals would need to be in discussion, as Ian said earlier, with, with LPS and, and, challenge the, and challenge the value and say, look, I, I, I rented this shop uh, for £10,000 and look, you put a rateable value on it for £15,000. It can't yeah. be right. And if that's the case and the evidence is shown and the evidence is shown uh, of, the, of, of where LPS have misinterpreted the rental value or, or applied uh, overall values that are not consistent with the, the open market And does value. the rental tone vary from street to street? Absolutely. Well, as, as you would know, you know one street, uh, part of a street can make a very big difference in terms of the mm. value of the so, street. So let's come to Valamina, for example. Church Street historically was the shopping street. Yeah. Uh, now the tone of it is substantially below Bama Money Street. Mm -hmm. So suddenly the premises in Bama Money Street are, feel that they're getting exorbitant NEVs mm -hmm. in comparison with the heart of the town in Church Street. And, and, and did that very much change in certainly 2015 and there were substantial reductions in Church Street, if I recall. Sure. Um, and um, I'm not familiar with the, the, the figures just for this 2020 rebalance yeah, I've, I've moved uh, in, in my role. But I think, again, that that's something very clearly that the district value will want to look at any issues like that. Uh, they have been out and about doing a number of meetings with, used with, with councils and with the chambers to meet people. They have run uh, the stead and run clinics with people to, to talk through those issues. But, but at the um, end of the day, um, they, have to, they have to reap the same income from rates, so they spread it differently. No, that's no. About, no, this is the valuer we're talking about. I'm not talking about the valuer. Um, the valuer is there um, under statute to put a fair valuation on the property. The valuer is not looking at, at income because um, you will know that rates is a, like a back to front tax because you, you know with the values are only used to apportion out the, the liability. The liability is is established by other people. Uh, and so the valuer is not there to end guess the game of how much revenue will be raised. Mm. Rates is a tax where you decide what C is and you use uh, A, your values, to work out your poundage. So it's a back to front type of tax, it's not a transactional tax. So, so, so the valuer is not there to guess uh, whether uh, more money will be collected from Balamoni versus Balamina or one street or the other. They're there to do a statutory valuation and I'm hard to do that and, and not to, to have any recognition let, of the collection. Let me, let me ask you, either of you a different question. We have this 100% charity exemption, yep. which means that many of our high streets, which are overpopulated by charity shops, are enjoying the benefit of zero rates competing with shops with high rates. Yep. <clears throat> Where are we on re-examining the 100% charity exemption? Just to clarify, the charity exemption applies to the proportion of the goods sold in the shop. Which oh, yes. yes. So if a shop is selling 50% manufactured or new goods in the charity shop, then the valuation, the exemption... And do you depend on the shop to tell you that? Not necessarily, no. 
Well, what do you depend on? Well, our own staff who do the inspections. But you can have a situation where a charity shop can sell a particular good, a goods, a, with more headspace on the profit margin because they don't have the overheads compared with the bona fide business next door. Well, rates would be one of their overheads. Stop yep. possibly. Well, not but rates, I think, are the biggest overhead for most premises in, a, in our high street. I might dispute that for most shops because staff costs would be your biggest overhead. Well, okay. Um, okay. And charity shops would be mostly staffed by volunteers. But I, I take your point. Yes, there is, there's, an, there's an issue with a number of charity shops in a lot of locations. Um, and this is part of a bigger picture, I think, about the high streets, um, which is whether uh, there needs to be some some examination of whether we should be looking at um, changing the use of some of the premises from retail into some other kinds of uses. I think there are probably simply too many shops. In most so, look, I remember asking you folk this three, four years ago, and there was expectation that things were going to change. In those three or four years, nothing has changed. Sorry, just, I just want to back up. Ed, what, sorry, I just didn't quite pick that up because we seem to be um, moving everything up and down outside, which I apologise for. Sorry. But you said something about there's too many shops? Right, that's, I, suppose, I suppose I'm kind of bleeding into one of my previous jobs where I worked in regeneration. Most town centres, um, the number of shops in the town centres um, were developed in response to the market conditions that there were maybe 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. The intervening period, of course, is the rise of internet shopping. So essentially, shopping habits have changed to the extent that there is, there's no prospect using rates mechanisms or any other to bring back the same kind of retailing economy in most town centres as it may have been anticipated to be 20 years ago. So there will have to be some kind of adjustment in the use of the property in town centres away from retailing, which can't be sustained in the current market, into some other productive economic use, whether that's residential or some other kind of economic function. Right, OK. Uh, and what about my question about uh, have things just stayed stagnant for the last three or four years about addressing the issue of exemptions? Well, I could pick that up because, uh, yeah, so the 2016 uh, consultation, the, one of the proposals was uh, in terms of the, uh, and the minister, I'd say, is much familiar, and that consultation said, should, should everybody pay yeah. something, I think was the cash yeah. line. Yeah. And so that consultation um, was was in in train 2016-2017, when obviously the you know the assembly the, the assembly yeah. closed, um, and so that consultation we, we could do absolutely nothing because that'd be a change of primary legislation. Yeah. We can't change primary legislation. What well, are you have. planning now to change? Well, it's, this is part of the review now, in which we uh, we went back out. Uh, to, we started as as Ian alluded to earlier. Uh, so the consultation we looked at again, very broad, broadly based look at business rates, and we went out um, where we we have 239 responses, which is a very high number of responses right across the province and across many sectors. Um, and, and there is no doubt that this is a hot topic. Um, and uh, but there is, it is very divided uh, because uh, where some people will be, you know see charity shops as bringing good, um, and and they are obviously a charity and they're enjoying tax uh, release because people give to charities and so should we tax them again for their occupation of the shop so that that's something that will be part of the review uh, and will be part of the report to the minister now for for his consideration uh, but the, it, it is very divided as to whether um, uh, we should uh, ask a charity shop to pay something i, I mean the, the position with throughout the rest of the uk is that the local authorities in england uh, there is an 80% uh, automatic uh, relief for charity shops, and then the local authority have discretion in relation to the 20%. But my understanding is that in most cases it is given as 100%. Um, so yes, okay. that is something that will be part of the, the consideration by the minister as to what we should do in terms of charity shops. Chair, sure, would you allow me one more question? Yeah, I can. Uh, in relation to what's in your paper about land registry fees, you indicate that there's been over-collection in the sense that they, they have a, a surplus. Is that categorised in budgetary terms as money that has to go back to the consolidated fund? Uh, no, it's absorbed partially into the department's budget, internal resource budget. So it's like a kind of, um, in the terms of the budgetary process, it's a surrender. So we know we're going to get more money in, project we're going to get more money in, we surrender. It does not have to go back as a consolidated fund uh, extra receipts? Um, 
I would have to check that out for you. Well, could you check that? Because I must say, my perception is it would. Uh, what was the audit office criticism that's referred to? Of, of that? Yeah. It's essentially that the fees are too high and yeah. higher than they need to be. Yeah. Because yeah. if it's the case that you're gaining more fees, but you can't actually keep the extra money, it's a consolidated fund extra resource that has to go back, then extra receipt that has to go back, well then <coughs> what's keeping you from reducing that? Um, again, it was the need to pass legislation. Yeah. The fees order is um, an affirmative resolution regulation. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Officer. Pat? Thanks very much, Chair. <clears throat> and if you'll allow me just to go back, because um, it'll lead on to my question on the second one. I was looking just, I was interested at the, uh, the international airport here that yeah. we have in Northern Ireland and, you, uh, and your formulation on how that rate works out. I mean, when I look at the competition or how it tries to, to gain its revenue and I go to Dublin where there's like a cheaper form of travel where there's no tax on it, um, I think it would be, it's very unfair to look at probably England, Scotland or Wales for the amount of travel which we have to partake from Northern Ireland here in order just to try and do business. So it's a non-fair competition to judge uh, on the buildings uh, for that domestic market. That's just my my own observation of what you said. Be then, I too, Pardon? You're misunderstanding then, so maybe in terms of just how I put that over. In terms of one of the essential core parts of that valuation is the construction cost. Yes. Um, and um, there, is, there was an agreed uh, working party to agree the cost of construction for all the component parts of airports. Um, and the, the part that we have used is the, those agreed construction costs of airports by the airport user group, and then we, those were adjusted because uh, adjusted because of Northern Ireland's construction differences in cost and also the date of the valuation. Alan, so was that adjusted up or adjusted down? Well, it depends. Actually, it depends whether uh, we can take uh, because the revaluations in England and, and Wales have happened <coughs> in, in 2010. And 2017. So we've actually done it both ways, Chair. We've gone 2010 forward, 2017 back in terms of looking at and some of the figures. So we've we've been able to to use it both ways. So it has to be adjusted for time, and has to be adjusted as well because construction costs are different. But we've been able to to do that to take that out of the equation. We 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 recognise fully that we are dealing with a different market, mm -hmm. but there is other other aspects that we can adjust that. Mr. Cadney, within the valuation, um, and, and we, we, we recognise the passenger numbers, and indeed that's one of the issues you know, where the discussion is that here we have an airport. And I'm, I'm a little nervous because we're getting into the details of one particular rate pair. Uh, so that in the generality of, of airports, you, you will look at the facility um, and look at the age of the construction, the, the runways, the hangars, the, all of those component parts. Uh, but certainly there is an adjustment in there in, in terms of, uh, I mean, the decap rate, the, the decapitalisation rate is also different, very similar. Uh, that's set under statute. So when we have the depreciated replacement cost, we apply the decap rate and it comes up with a value. And that's the way it's done throughout the rest of the UK. But no, it's not comparing right. apples and oranges, no, not by any means. It brings me in just to move on and just to compare the market. I mean, that were your own words, uh, Alan. And it's for my own self trying to figure it out. I mean, if we look at public house or the hospitality sector in Northern Ireland, if we look at it in England, all of that is on the tide. There is very, very few independent owners. By that I mean publicans that own their own premises, own their own license, yeah. uh, operate their own business. So they're doing this under a tie. And when you're doing this under a tie, I mean, we're, we're looking at, at we're, we're talking on turnover. So I can spread all my costs out with one accountant to do 500 bars, all right? I can go in and he can go in and do his stock ticks. That is not a gift which is given to a small private individual. So I, I believe that, you know, when you're looking at this or when you're using that English model, it's not, you know, you're not comparing apples with apples. It's a completely different type of market. But it's only an observation that I'm making with you on that. I mean, there's very, very few licensed premises in Northern Ireland that are out to lease to a tied brewery. There are thousands in England. 
Yeah, and, and I think we recognise that uh, very much. So we recognise the different markets that apply in England and Scotland, Wales, uh, and, and the Republic of Ireland. Um, and that's not the issue. We're not trying to mm -hmm. we're not trying to apply uh, one one pricing or one guide. What we're saying is there's a there's a there's an accepted valuation profession methodology uh, called the receipts and expenditure method, which takes all of those factors and comes comes down to a point of a divisible balance. Um, and and it will recognise the mm -hmm. Northern Ireland market, and, and we've talked before, uh, you know, on these sort of issues. And so, uh, and uh, you, you know, hospitality Ulster will tell me about the difference of a uh, a keg of beer in Northern Ireland versus uh, one a one in, in GB. The methodology and the approach and the analysis can take account of all that. The big issue is that, that we want to sit down and agree these matters with Hospitality Ulster. Um, and two, two and a half years ago, we, we sought to do that. And we have sought to do that, including this week, um, where we have tried to say, well, we, we want to get a scheme that, that we all can agree to. And as Ian said earlier, the equivalent schemes in GB have the branding along the bottom uh, of all of the equivalent of Hospitality Ulster. And it has been agreed in Scotland as well. We don't want to contest every pub. There are a thousand pubs or more. We don't want to be in a position where we have to contest them all or take them to the courts. That's not what we want to do. We want to agree a scheme valuation that is acceptable um, to everybody, that we can sign off and that we can apply it. Uh, to, to every pub in Northern Ireland, recognising they're different. Uh, but, so we're not applying yeah. English schemes or Scottish schemes. Well, I understand, but I was only using that on, the, yep, on no, no, what no. you had spoken on the yep. airport and how yep. you... Yep. The no. other bit, I mean, I, I have to tell you that public houses and hospi the hospital, it's, it's a unique type trade. It is not a guaranteed income. You cannot say, I'm going to increase my turnover 2% in the next year. And if, if I spend £100,000 doing my bar up, uh, it's going to probably, that, that's a 15 year outlay before that money comes back in. But you're penalising those publicans that are investing and trying to create the jobs where a, a bar opposite doesn't spend that money and finds himself, and I, I can give you examples where there's a difference of nearly £100,000 in a readable valuation. Uh, and, I mean, that's not right. You know, it's, that's creating unfair competition. But on top of that, uh, what you said there, that you have only 300 <coughs> people across Northern Ireland that have made that's contact right. with you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm reading it wrong, but I have had Quite a lot of quite a lot of businesses and retail businesses, and my question would follow on on the large multinationals. Uh, I, I have, most of them have seen across the board the rates drop by 15 percent. You talk about your last job uh, in in uh, regenerating uh, the city centres, and I go back to you won't go into a city centre if there's only one stall. We need them all working together in order to try and draw people in. You need a daytime economy and you need a nighttime economy. Uh, this is penalising uh, the, the businesses that are there and, and family businesses which have stood by this through thick and thin, through the worst of the troubles. And this is an onslaught, I, I'm telling you, to them now. I mean, if you're not hearing that with 300 calls, I can tell you that is... Uh, uh, Chair, I'm not sure. I was a past member of hospitality also. I don't know if that's a conflict of interest now or not, but I spent my life on a bar, so I, I, I know the consequences that comes with it and the different valuation that you have on the barrels that are the beer and the pricing structure that we have here. So it's a 40% on average of an increase on the retail sector. Would you accept that? And it's much higher. Well, these are, these, these are the figures that I'm getting of people that are pounding. I can only read out on my figures, but it's even higher within the hospitality sector. And you, I mean, I'm shocked. Uh, I don't know how much engagement has been with them or with their bodies, but I think the best way to do, when your people are out walking around and checking around the charity shops, I think that they put a wee call into a public house or into a bar manager, they'll find out how difficult or, or where that is, or how that trade generated. Um, okay, on the on the retail side. Yes. Okay. The 
overall position is that the total value of all the shops has actually gone down marginally from the previous list to the draft schedule. So it's now 99% mm -hmm. of what the previous list is. Within that, of course, there are some shops which have gone up, some shops which have gone down. Um, 80% of the shops in Northern Ireland, their values have either stayed the same or have decreased in this revaluation. 20% have gone up. Essentially, the, the movement in the market is that um, high streets and shopping centres um, and supermarkets have seen their trade decrease and go down. Their market share has uh, decreased. Discount retailers, um, like Little, for example, and um, Convenience stores, which are probably attached to petrol filling stations, have seen their share of the market go up. So the consequence is that you'll see that's the shift you will see in the values of the premises. I don't doubt that there is um, a small number of retailers who will have seen their valuations increase by 40%, but I would not in any shape or form accept that the average increase in the retail valuation of a shop is 40%. That simply would not be borne out by any of the figures. I didn't say all. I said some and most that have contacted me. Those that probably find that it has dropped, I'm sure I won't probably hear from them. But you will, you will at least agree with me that the multinationals have all had a drop yeah. on average of 15%. And in 2013, which is the date for the valuation in the previous list, the supermarkets were most certainly at the height of their market yeah. movements. There's no and how does that sit uh, with, um, with, with the regeneration of our city centres when, when they have free parking, uh, all of that, that that sits with that, and the sizes of them, you know, as well as how they generate. I mean, is that on rental income, or is that just purely on turnover? Okay, just to, I mean, can I just want to clear up something? Because the value under the statute can take no recognition of the occupier. So whether they are a local trader mm -hmm. or a multi yeah, is not something that the value takes into Too account. And when we're looking, the, so the value is looking at somewhere like a Tesco's. Um, they're looking at a Tesco's or an ASDA or, or whatever. Oh, we're, 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 not, we're not looking at oh, yeah. whether it's a multinational or not. And as Ian has said, in 2015, um, the large food superstores saw a substantial increase. Some of these properties have rateable values approaching one million pounds of rateable value um, and so um, in 2000 uh, in, in 2013 the, the the large food stores were at the top of their market and 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 since then um, any market Evans will tell you that you know people are not doing the big trolley shop it's moved towards the convenience market and so so the value of those large superstores, has dropped slightly, and that indicate we follow the market. We're not sitting, we're LPS are not trying to say well, maybe we should charge the multinationals less or more. We're we're following it purely as a value, follows the market, and so the evidence shows that the large food stores have seen a decline, but they are still massively ahead in in a price per square meter or whatever way you look at it of, of any other equivalent building. Um, and, and that follows the trend. We saw that trend in 2017 in England and Wales as well. Mm -hmm. And so, al albeit there are some falls, the, the, the pricing is, if you, if you look at what's on a large Tesco's or a large Asda or Sainsbury's, not just a, other, other brands are available, so, you know, and you compare that to the value of a shop, I mean, it's massively different. But would you uh, at least um, agree with me that uh, you... If, if we're trying to, to make it as fair as we possibly can, and that's what, what you've already said to me, the bottom line on this is, is not on the valuer. The bottom line is what you pay out, what I pay out as a businessman, and that's or where I was, and that's the, the main concern. Regardless of how that figure comes, I, I, I am not sure, uh, if you'll allow me, just, sure. I'm not sure that this rating system at the moment is I would not be comfortable with it as an MLA. I would have to challenge it, and I would have to. I think there must be a fair mechanism out there in order to try and do it. But to go out and to to try to use the turnover, uh, regardless of the investment or the capital spend that went into that in order to get that going, I think it's a very unfair and unjust. And like Bottom line, going back the other way, going back from the valuation. We're not using turnover, so rates are not based on turnover. Well, you're, are, 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 you, are you looking at it for, for books for in order 
to, to look at the hospitality sector and the, and, uh, the public every, houses. Every single property in Northern Ireland, because this is what the statute, this is what the rates Northern Ireland order yeah. tells us to do. It tells us to assess a rental value. Um, and there are methods, many methods of getting to that rental value where there is no evidence. In terms of some of the pubs, I mean, there are quite a few rents that we do have for pubs. And in fact, the rents. Uh, I'm, I'm Did not you take the rental value from England? I'm not. No, no. What we're looking at, we have Northern Ireland rents, um, and we have rents for quite a number of pubs. Um, and I've spoken to the valuers this week, and quite a few of the rents that we see are higher than the rateable values that have been assessed for 2020. So there is, re there is some rental evidence there. There is not sufficient rental evidence uh, in order to make a fair assessment of all the pubs in Northern Ireland. Uh, I think we, we need to watch that. You know, there, there, are, there are something like 60% uh, of the pubs in Northern Ireland are eligible for small business rate relief, which means that their rateable value is up to £15,000. So we, we have to be careful that there are some very big headline figures here. But on the whole, 40% uh, of pubs will see no change or indeed a decrease in the rateable value. And 60% of the pubs are, are eligible for SBRR. We do not value pubs on turnover, nor do we value hotels. But how do you, I mean, that mechanism? We, we, have, to, we have to assess our value. <coughs> and, and the value goes to the court. It, it is as to prove that the valuation, the, the, the net annual value is correct, and the valuers will be appointed from both sides to make sure. That's so it's, it's, a, it's a rental That's assessment, true. whether it's a quarry or a cinema okay. or anything else. But do, do, do alarm bells not ring with, with, with where you are whenever you see, you said there's now 1,000 public houses left here in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I, when I started chair, I mean, there was over 2,000. Yes, we had the troubles, and I know the impact uh, through the bonds and public houses then were probably a, a target or looked upon as a target. But the alarm bells not ring with you. And the, the amount of people that's employed within this sector, I mean, I've come in here to create jobs. I want to see this economy grow. I really think that, that this is going the opposite way. It's going to take away from that jobs because there is no way... Uh, uh, my colleague Jim there raised the point, in order to find that revenue, you're going to have to cut back on, co on costs, and the biggest cost is that of staffing. Okay. Just, uh, the the valuer's job in LPS is to do a very simple job, in a sense, is to put, the, the statute says put a rental value, put, a, put an NAV on every property. I think that's the value. Um, the tax is a very different thing. And so the tax of what actually is demanded is, is, is a factor of the district rate and the regional rate. So whatever the value is, it's only a value. The value is there to apportion the tax mm -hmm. between one occupier and another. I suggest to you that the issue for us in Northern Ireland is that we've got a very high poundage. And that's something that came through very clearly in the review, where we have a poundage between 55 and 65 pence in the pound, which is greater uh, if you're if you're in, in England, it will be 50 to 51p in the pound. So being taxed at 65% of the rental value, I suggest, Mr. Catney, with respect, is the issue because that's where the taxation comes in. Uh, yes, there are arguments to be had in terms of is the rental value assessment correct, and I think that's 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 for the valuers to discuss. At yes, and the courts, just the would courts you agree with me? Inside. Would you agree with me that? Uh, within that sector, uh, let's call it loyalty, and I mean, customers, I don't want to be too hard on them, but they can be very fickle, are you with me? If there's a new bar opens and it's got all dancing, all singing, they're going to move there, that, especially that younger clientele is going to move there. Meanwhile, we're landed with this high uh, bill which has been forced upon them, and you may say, why are you after all of the figures from the public houses, if, you, if you're saying to me now you don't use them. I don't think I did say I don't use them. Uh, what I'm saying to you is that... Do you engage with some, them for their accounts? The valuers do you have... I thought we started that off. You said that you asked them for, for their accounts. Yeah, we did. was part of that process. Yeah, and, 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 yeah we asked for accounts, and uh, we asked for accounts in order to establish a rental value. Yes. And we do have some rental evidence, but the valuers are saying there's not enough rental evidence on which to... To come to so how do you come to it then again? Back to the same question. Because we, as Ian said earlier, we've had to go to companies' house to That's try and get. Uh, but it, look, at the, at the end of the day, um, 
we would prefer to, to reach, uh, as an organisation, reach an agreement like our colleagues in the rest of the UK in terms of an agreed scheme. If that agreed, agreed scheme cannot be reached, then we do have to then deal with each one on an individual basis, and that, that's fine, we'll have to do that. That's, that's not a good use of everybody's time and our resource. Uh, but in a sense, that's what we're asked to do, and that's what the statute uh, that you know Northern Ireland has in place, it says to fix a rental value, fix a rateable value on that pub. Um, and uh, we have to then leave it to the valuers to, to come up with the point, is, is that valuation right? Aside from that, then, we've got this issue of, of what's actually charged and what's billed at the end of the day. But I think it's a valuation issue that needs to be taken a, a, away and let the valuers decide. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I just moved. Oh, sure. yeah. um, first of all, there are a lot of Brontes in the South Down, so it'll be very nice to you. There are no Snowdens. There are. So, that's where I'm from. You're from South Down? Yes. <laughs> from Dramara. No, that's not South Down. That's work, I suppose not. No, you're lagging Valley, so from Bally but there's far too many Brontes, so we'll have to be very, <laughs> very careful around Glasgow and places like that. So, um, ju ju just a couple of questions. I'm a bit concerned. You said there are 55,000 um, businesses have been re-rated, and the number of calls you've had is in the low 200s. Yeah. I, 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 that just doesn't add up to me because this is one of the hottest I issues in town as far as MLA is concerned. Mm -hmm. so sorry, Ian, sorry, just, uh, just got a, could you give us a, a detailed breakdown on those stats? Because look, you know, I've had about 100 calls in my office alone. <laughs> and if we multiply that by the number of MLAs, well, I'm... I don't want to be disrespectful to any MLA, um, but if the ratepayer is contacting you, you, you ought to be telling them to contact us. Yeah, we, we do. We want them to we contact do. us. The, the problem is that... It's no uh, disrespect, we do tell them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they need to contact us. If they have a problem and they think our valuation is wrong, they ought to be getting in contact with us. If they want to challenge it, they ought to be getting in contact with us. The more that we can get resolved before the end of March, the better for everybody. The, the website, though, and the, uh, and the detail that we've now made available <coughs> of this kind, people are, we know that they are looking at that, and they're looking because they can now go in and look on a map and see the rateable value and see the breakdown uh, if in a shop, in an office, in a warehouse, in a factory, because you can go onto the, the, the system and look at it on a spatial, you can look on an aerial photography or a map base, and you can see the valuation of that shop, how it compares to the one next door and the one next door. And it's all there. People are using that. We know that by the hits on the website, sir. Um, and we know that people are finding that useful. So they're comparing and saying, why is my shop at this figure and that that figure? And they can see that online. And, um, and we've made that available for the first time. The Permanent Secretary said that last week. And so we're finding that people quite like to self-serve. Um, and if they can find the detail within the website and the pages or by looking at the, at the information, then perhaps they don't need to phone us. But. Jim, sorry, sorry for coming across here. Not the Gunny test goes. 15% cut in their rates. A very profitable site, a very busy site. Meanwhile, Willie John or Seamus in the town centre with a sweet shop or a news agent, he's seeing 20 to 40 percent increase, at least 15 percent increase. Do you take account as to the location of the mega store? Because obviously it may be there could be Tesco's in Stoban or Fermanagh or somewhere that are struggling, but certainly the one in Knocknagun is not. So therefore, is it a blanket 15 percent cut if you're a Tesco mega store, or is it done on the basis of the particularities of the site? That's one individual. You know, it, yeah. uh, Tesco, North Dagonia, I know the 15% cut seems substantial. The, the rateable valuation of that premises is still over £1.3 million. They, they are very large rate pair. Now, um, if, uh, I think it's possibly unlikely. There may be an individual case in, you know, um, that a, a, a small shop in the centre of a town will see a 20% increase in valuation, but almost all town centre premises, retail premises, have either stayed static or gone down in value. But like a small pub, the Tesco's have off licences. Yes. So, and that, I mean, there's one off licence in Uri has the record in, in the supermarket has the record for the largest amount ever sold at a single day in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Over a million pounds worth of alcohol went out that door at a certain Christmas when the exchange rate was favourable. Meanwhile, you've got Seamus or, or John down the road, and they're struggling. Why? I mean, given that those set of circumstances. Why should any mega store be getting a cut in the present uh, economic circumstances? And as Mr. Brody said, we can't take any account of who the occupier of the premises is. And I suppose it goes. The, it's essentially the same point as Mr. Catney was making. We have to operate on the basis of the evidence that's available. Um, 
perhaps we've misinterpreted the evidence that we've got, or there are other pieces of evidence that haven't been supplied to us, in which case the rate payers should come to us and challenge us on that. On the other hand, um, if there are dissatisfaction um, but no evidence to back up the dissatisfaction, we've got nothing else to work with. Um, and if there are alternative methods by which we might arrive at the rateable value of a property which is not evidence-based, um, you know, we that's not available to us. We have to follow the legislation and apply the legislation correctly. But the evidence is that somebody like Tesco's or Asda or Sainsbury's or Dunn's are big multi-million pound companies and could sustain their present rate demand, whilst the small shop in the middle of the town can't. Can you not take into account the fact that it's part of a multinational? So the legislation, we, we're, you know, you know, if, if, if this assembly want to bring through different legislation after the minister has brought proposals, uh, after the review, that's that's up to the grant of this of this house. Um, the current legislation asks us to put a net annual value in every property, so it's a rental assessment, and it's the same as the Tesco's as it is of the corner shop. It's the same as the Centra or any other convenience store, and so. We do not say, well, we know this individual, this company could bear more or, or they're more profitable than the other. We follow the market. We follow the market. And so one of those very large um, supermarkets <coughs> built, built a, uh, a very large food storage store in Northern Ireland uh, around about the date of the last revaluation. And the, the market stopped and went downhill. And they didn't ever fit it out. They let it off and subdivided it. Now, that shows you that the, the market has changed for large supermarkets. But I think, you know, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, you use the spatial tool and go in and have a look at the values that we're talking about it's here. It's not on your spatial so tool, not Nagoni. Sorry? It's not on the not Nagoni's not, not on the spatial tool. Is it, it, the price per square metre isn't on it? It's not on it at all. But it's the only thing that's on it is the cash machine. But it's a rateable value of nine and a half thousand. But I think you'll find, I think if you look, there'll be, say, maybe one of two. And so if you look at the top the icon, you can move the. We're very happy to pick that up with you later on. There, there are, we, we need to look at the reality of the total valuation of a prop. So just, just, just a second, Alan. Is that, Jim, is that just on uh, that particular site or is that on a different. Just going to have a look at another. valuation site. All right. Um, by the way, I can tell you this building. Has a rateable value of one million three hundred and forty-seven thousand. Hmm. But uh, so, so don't know how that was worked out. <laughs> well, probably on office pricing. Yeah. So yeah. Um, if there, if we look, if we look at these large supermarkets, yes, there's been an adjustment, but well, there's a huge difference, Mr. Wells, with the, the value per square foot, or yeah. But it, it is done on a valuation <clears throat> basis. But the problem is that these mega stores, and we've one now in Banbridge, is having a huge impact on the on the retail sector in the town. And we've gone from a situation, uh, I live in Banbridge, so I know a fair bit about it, gone from a situation where there was total, every, every shop in Banbridge had a tenant. And now you're beginning to get empty property. Immediately after a huge store. A store, by the way, which when it's complete and has all its uh, areas functional, will have a throughput on their figures, bigger than all of Banbridge, to more and refine and put together. Now, no town can sustain that. And yet that store has enjoyed, like many others, a rate cut. And yet it's having a profound impact on, on businesses in the core of the town. Yeah, I, I, have to, I have to repeat again with respect that we are not here to make those type of decisions. We are here to, to do what the statute asks us to do. And the statute is asking us to put a rental value on our property. We follow the market in relation to our property. We do not make judgments around whether we think that's good that that store is there, whether it's detrimental to Bambridge or whether Tesco's or any other large <coughs> shop can afford it. That's not the decision that we're We'd be acting ultra varies to in any way take that into account. We follow the market. But, but in GB, there's rate relief <coughs> for <coughs> shops which have a rateable value of less than £51,000. Right. We have a much lower threshold. Why is that? Well, the, the scheme that was brought in in 2010 uh, was very similar to the rest of the UK, um, and it tailed out at 15,000 rateable values. Yes. Uh, the Chancellor has brought through different schemes over a couple of years uh, in England. Um, Scotland has followed to some extent, and, and Wales too, so they have different schemes. Over the last three years, it would not have been possible to change 
that scheme um, and the small business rate relief is one of the three SRs in front of the committee today and that was brought through because it was negative resolution. Um, we stated the existing scheme. We would not have been able to make any change to that scheme. Um, and really then as part of the review, the minister will have to take that to the executive as to what he wants <coughs> to do in relation to the small business rate relief scheme. <coughs> But certainly, as civil servants, we would not have been able to make any change yes, over the last couple of years. And so, um, I think you, there, there is a very big difference, though. And, and I think if we were to try yeah. and introduce similar schemes in Northern Ireland of similar levels of value, it would be exceedingly expensive, and that's not something that details of that's something the executive will have to look at. But it does put a small business in GP in a much better standing to oppose the multinational mega stores than the similar small the business. Scheme is certainly more attractive yeah. to small business. Just, uh, just through in and on, if it would be possible for the uh, LPS to provide us with details of the uh, details of the review and what's going and sort of the timelines as well, if we got a briefing on that, that would be very useful. Yeah. Happy enough. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, Sean? Okay, thanks, man. In terms of challenges, uh, how many is revalued either up or down? What percentage would be revalued if somebody had a good argument that the, it was too high? In, in, in terms of what, uh, all of the non domestic properties? Yeah. Um, I think it's certain, certainly 75 percent of retail property has stayed the same or come down um, in terms of I think I gave you the figure earlier or 40 percent of pubs um, I'm struggling to get no, I think he was asking no. about a challenge or a challenge, challenge. Oh, sorry I beg your pardon sorry yeah. um, you mean back it's in, in a in 2015 yeah. I don't have I don't have those figures to hand <coughs> yeah the last time around no I don't I don't have I those don't figures have to hand in terms of uh, sports clubs, um, I came to light yesterday into the All Party Group and Sport and Rec Recreation that there is a 30 to 40 increase in NBAs. Now, in terms of us promoting healthy living through the programme of government, would this not be inconsistent with that? Well, again, as, as Alan's explained in relation to pubs and, and the shops, question, this is all based on the evidence relating to the individual properties. You've got to put a rental yeah. value on that particular property. Um, so there's, there's no option for LPS to take any other factor into account because the legislation does not permit that. Um, if the Assembly decided that other considerations, such as those have been expressed today, are the kinds of things that they would like to take into account on the valuation of property for rates purposes, then that would need to be placed into the legislation. On sport and recreation facilities, amateur sports clubs are entitled to fairly substantial relief. 80% 80, 80 relief, so they only pay 20% of the normal liability. And if it's a community amateur sports club, they have 100% relief mm -hmm. on that anything would, but the bar. That would be GA clubs and yes. soccer clubs. Yep. So they, they have a readable value assessed in the same way, so that annual value. Um, you'll, be, you'll go to sleep being really fed up listening to that one line that I've been using. But the reliefs that are there for us for sport and recreation gives you 80 percent relief, and if it's a community amateur sports club, it's 100 percent relief. And just lastly, Chair, in terms of getting in touch, Ian, um, where do you get in touch? Is there a, a line? Uh, yes, phone it's a line. Phone line. The, the, um, there's a website on the Department of Finance. Um, internet site, um, which is about Reval 2020, and full details on how to contact her there, and it's either by telephone or you can contact us online. Okay, thank you, Jim. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Gemma? Yeah, thank you. Um, just, um, there's two schemes that lapsed um, in March 2017 because of the lack of an assembly, um, the Rural ATM and Back in Business. Mm -hmm. Are you aware, or do you know, um, if that will be reintroduced, or will it be decided? Um, it hasn't been decided. That'd be a matter for the minister uh, to, to work on. Um, it doesn't need to be decided before the rate bills go out because both of those schemes are application based. So no, they no, could... sorry, the, the ATM wasn't application. All oh, right, okay. Um, but there were 94 rural ATMs, yeah. um, so there, there weren't a huge <coughs> number were affected by it. The back in business scheme is an application based scheme. Um, that was very popular. I think there was quite a lot of support for bringing that back. Um, but again, it'll be for the Minister to take a view on whether he wants to reintroduce that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, 
Your ambition is to raise almost 1.4 billion uh, in rates let's say, this year. To what extent have you realised uh, that? And uh, secondly, I know that uh, the suggestion that you may have proposals for raising the amount of rates collected entirely. Uh, how would you uh, propose to do that? Is it the case of actually broadening the rates based pairs? Uh, or is it the case of actually raising rates in certain days? Or would you, what would your suggestions there? Okay, the current year's rating collection target, um, we're slightly behind on that um, by comparison to what the target is. We're £26 million pounds ahead of the same position at the end of December, which is the last yet I had the figures for. There are a few late assessments which have just been agreed, which will be coming in on um, um, fairly substantial sums of money. But we think we might be in the region of 10 to 12 million pounds short of that target this year. And, uh, and raising rates in that in the future as well too, is there any proposals that um, we have there? Well, we don't set the rates. Um, the, the target on the, uh, for rate collection is, is linked to the um, rates that are set by district councils and by the executive, even the district rate and regional rate. So we take the rates that parties that are set, apply those on to the valuation lists, and then we can work out what we should be seeking to bring in in terms of the rates assessments and then what our target should be for collection in order to raise the amount of money which both the executive and the district council say they want to bring in. So we don't have ambitions to bring more rates in in that sense. Our job is simply to collect the rates for the for the for the executive and for the councils as efficiently as possible. Okay Tim. Um, Ian, Alan, thank you very much indeed. However, Alan you're not going away anywhere yet. Um, uh, we now need to move on to the next item, which is on uh, again part of four, which is suborder rule legislations ratings progressed since 2017. And I believe Alan, you're going to uh, brief us, uh, provide an overview of the ratings le legislation uh, progressed since 2017. I'd like you to draw, team. I'd like you to draw your attention to the clerk's paper on page 253, which provides uh, a summary of the SRs received between 2017 and 2019. And I would also like to draw your attention to a letter from the Department Letter to update the Committee for Finance on outstanding from 20, January 2017, page 257. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, if it's possible, Chair, um, with your permission, I'd like to group together a number of these because, um, so if I, if I could start first of all with the, the rate small business heritament relief, which we've in a sense referred to just now, um, and which I will um, probably use that acronym SBRR, yeah, Small Business Rate Relief. So that's SR 2017-72, SR 2018-61, and SR 2019-44. Um, these three uh, SRs were made by the Department to extend the Small Business Rate Relief Scheme, which would otherwise have lapsed. Um, and so the, the SRs were made following agreement of the annual budget exercise and announced by the Secretary of State alongside the regional rate decision. Uh, as the Chief Executive said earlier, the regional rate uh, legislation went through Westminster because it was a, a affirmative resolution, um, but these uh, rate relief regulations were negative um, and that no change was made other than to extend the qualifying year to enable um, rate payers to benefits from small business rate relief uh, in the three years um, of uh, 17, 18, 18, 19, and 19, 20. And there's no, uh, we had no ability to enhance the scheme in the absence of ministers. Um, uh, and, and so we basically set it through those three SRs to enable SBRR to mm -hmm. apply. Is that? Questions. I can move on if um, move through. Um, yeah. So uh, the another two that I, if I could uh, put together, would be the rate relief regulations for the Ireland 2017, uh, which is SR 2017 uh, 184 and also SR 2018 109. Um, these SRs uh, would provide for rate relief for eligible claims and came into operation as a result of the making of the, the commencement order in terms of welfare reform. Um, and previously, the executive had agreed to the rate re replacement scheme. Um, there were three public consultations on that. 
and to not have implemented this SR in SIF 17 would have meant that new universal credit uh, recipients in Northern Ireland wouldn't have any access to rebate support provision. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no change uh, to the provision for those that, uh, you know, who hadn't their social security benefits uh, migrated to universal credit. Um, and then after the initial period, the department made some amendments to the rate rebate replacement. Um, the, an executive paper on the functioning of the scheme, Chair, will need to come back to the Northern Ireland Executive in due course. Um, and that paper will be informed by an external review commissioned by the department um, on the scheme last year. So this was a very important SR. Um, uh, there have been over 32,000 claims made to date, about £9 million in, of rate rebate awarded. Um, okay. um, if I can then move to um, the SR 2017-231, which is the Rates on Occupied Peridiliments Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017. Um, this amendment arose uh, as a result of the extensive flooding in 2017 in the northwest. Um, in some respects, it, it was there to allow those, those people who had to leave their home because of the flooding um, and who would have had to continue to pay rates because, just for the side, we know that the rating of empty homes, or empty homes are still rated, so you pay full rates on an empty home. Um, these homes were not sufficiently uh, damaged to, you know, to be not, they could have been, they were able to be repaired and brought back in, so they couldn't be removed from the valuation list. Um, and so, uh, we tagged um, the, this exclusion from the rating of empty homes to the uh, local authority uh, regulations in terms of if they qualified for a compensation scheme from the local council due to the flooding, as uh, under the 1992 uh, order, then and the property had been occupied for a continuous period of not less than four weeks, uh, we brought through this SR to give uh, people up to a maximum of six months. Uh, rate free where they were as it were evacuated from the home due to flooding. Uh, there are 93 properties benefited from this with 41,000 was the cost of the uh, exclusion. Mm. Um, and then I want to move to the uh, two SRs, 2018 of 67 and 2019 of 198. And these concern uh, really in a way how telecommunications, natural gas and water are entered into the valuation list. Obviously, these type of utilities um, are not in, in one place. You can't put a red line around them on a, on a, on a map, and so they're valued in a different way. Um, and uh, each property appears separately in the valuation list. Um, and as a new supplier comes into the utility market, then we require to make a new regulation uh, otherwise, we would not be able to collect non-domestic rates from that supplier, and therefore these two uh, these two SRs were made to bring into uh, the valuation list two new uh, suppliers. If I can move on, two new suppliers. Well, yeah, two two companies. So you'll see yeah, that the companies plan. are listed. Um, on the SR, um, it, each each time there's a regulation, it lists the company names. So because you can't really use an address uh, yeah. when you're using uh, for a gas undertaking. So you'll see that each of the SRs have uh, uh, one will have a, a one list, and then the, the next time is a longer list. So, so Belfast Gas Transmission, Fermis Energy, Phoenix Gas, Premier Transmission, mm. uh, and so forth. And so by listing those names then we're able to attribute a value in the valuation list and in that way collect oh, uh, non-domestic rates. If I move on then to yeah, SR... So one second. So 67... Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see that. See the name of the listed. Am I, am I listening to someone? Agenda item 
Apologies for this time. I'm just checking it. When I was reviewing it, I didn't see the name of the company, which is what I was surprised. So that's why I'm just, I'm they, just checking. They, it, it probably is there. I just need to have it. Yeah, it's, I have the copy. It's on the schedule. So um, on the front of the SR, um, it's on the second page of each of the SR, Schedule 2, Part, schedule part 2. Um, on the earlier version, it's on the third page. Um, I can provide Sorry, Joe, this is SR 2867? Uh, 2867, yeah. There's there's a page three and a plan. Yeah. So, don't explain it really. Can I give you a copy? Would that help you? Am I missing it? No, we've got it in front of us. We're just reading it. I'm not trying to be difficult, I just generally didn't oh, see it. And I was just, when you mentioned the name of the company, and I was going, uh, can, I, can I give you the copy of the SR here? Would that yeah, yes, me? please. Yeah. Thanks. We do read them. Right. Trust me. <laughs> okay, I'm moving on to SR 2018 uh, of 68, um, and this is uh, the new NEV list brackets time evaluation close brackets order. Mm -hmm. um, and I've referred to this earlier in terms of each every time we have a revaluation for revaluation 2020, we have to uh, ascertain the valuation date, and it's uh, in the normal course where. At this point in time, uh, the valuation date, the reference point or whatever, is set two years before the publication are coming into effect. And not to have taken this through, um, this is non-controversial, um, and the essential feature of a revaluation is this set evaluation date. And that is merely what that was doing, is establishing that the market valuation is based at 1 April 2018, two years prior to the new valuation is coming into effect. Okay. Um, the, the next one that I want to take is the SR 20, uh, 2025, the rates making and levying of different rates regulations. Um, and this uh, is one that came through just a, a number of weeks ago because, um, the, again, this is to accompany the revaluation process. Um, it restates the long-standing provision to allow different rates to be levied on NAVs and capital values. Um, the change implemented by the CSR is to update the formula that links the domestic district rate struck by councils to the non-domestic rate struck by councils. Many of you will know that effectively this allows the council to make one rate striking decision. Um, and the updated formula, which we refer to as the conversion factor, preserves the relative burden shared between the domestic and the non-domestic parts of the council tax base that existed prior to the revaluation exercise coming into effect. And so it was essential, uh, Chair, to bring this SR through to allow district councils to move through mm -hmm. the rate striking, which they're all in the process of doing now. Uh, once we had the outturn values from the valuation list, um, that we knew the, the, that increase of uh, a, a by council uh, percentage in Northern Ireland then we were able to, the economists were able to, to provide those conversion factors which are then applied uh, by, the, uh, by each council as they would strike the rate. Um, Any comments on that Tim? I think that's all of I think if we move through the, all of them I think. Okay, thank you. Right, let's start reading. Oh, yeah, it's alright, it's alright. So it's. Uh, team, just to wonder, what's your agreement to move on to agenda item 19? Which is. Uh, oh, Alan, sorry, we need you still. You're not allowed to run away just yet. <laughs> uh, SL1, the rate, regional rates order in Northern Ireland 2020. Um, <clears throat> I want to draw your attention to the clerk's briefing paper on SL1, the rates, regional rates order in Northern Ireland 2020 at page 404, and the SL1 from the department at page 405. 
setting out the purpose of the draft rule. This rule is subject to Assembly Affirmation Resolution Procedure. The purpose of the draft rule is to set the amount of the domestic and non-domestic regional rates for the year ending 31st of March 2021. Members need to decide today whether they are content with the proposals at this stage or whether they require any further information from the Department. Uh, Alan, you are here to uh, stand by should we require any uh, further address or any queries on this and other proposals for such Norbert legislation and ratings issues. Yeah, this is this is very much chair the, the standard uh, regional rates order. There are obviously no figures in there. That's one for uh, the minister and the executive um, to to take forward. But at this stage, we're we're looking for the committee's agreement in terms of the the legislation as it's as it's currently presented. Um, and uh, that's again, I would suggest it's not controversial. It's it's very much a tried and tested uh, piece of legislation. Okay. Uh, but Sorry. it doesn't contain the poundage. No, it doesn't. Not at this stage. So you're asking us to have agreed to something ignorant way. of what the poundage will be to approve it blind. No, I'm not asking you to uh, agree to any of the figures. Those figures will come back. They'll come back. Uh, yeah, those will come back. And when? Well, when the minister has um, through the put the figures of the regional rate striking to the executive, and then that will come back. Um, I think it's an affirmative resolution um, of the Assembly. When are you expecting it? Uh, will that be part of the budget process, Mr Alistair? So it mm. will be tied into the, the budget process. Uh, and My understanding is that that will be mid-March. For a budget bill that needs royal assent by the 31st of March? Uh, well, it, it's, it, it, it will need, um, it's, it's mid-March because we need to get rate bills out as well. So, yes. Mm -hmm. um, um, yes, my understanding is that the budget will come back. Uh, the budget is something that will be hopefully be agreed in middle March, and that will be the regional rate order will be part of that process. So, what are we agreeing today? You're agreeing the form of the legislation, at, at which we're duty bound to do, and to give you that, and that's the process that has been followed in time and memorial. Um, uh, and that is that's the piece of uh, statutory rule that she in front of you, uh, um, uh, and, and as I say, the, there will be future on a future occasion uh, through the assembly. You will see the, the the figures for both the capital value regional rate and the non-domestic regional rate. Oh, what? Yeah. Uh, Alan, this may be a time when you get very nervous. Uh, you talk this as, you talk as, this, as if this is non-controversial, and it may not be. But again, I'm sure you have this these nervous fits at the start of a new term with an experienced MLAs on a new committee. Can you explain in layman's terms the, why this why this the rationale for this procedure? Why you need to get permission or consent from this finance committee? Whenever this really is a decision for the executive, and when you talk about mid-March, is that a decision by the executive, or is that the uh, budget bill? I think the budget um, and the setting of the regional rate will take place in March. Um, I presume if it can be done earlier, it will be done earlier. But that's this my understanding from those that deal with finance, and indeed from the minister, that that is something that he expects to be able to. Uh, provide LPS uh, with the two figures to allow the, the, the rate process to proceed. Um, in terms of this piece of legislation, I think it's important that, that we do have the legislation and draft with you um, and that that goes through all of the process of going to this committee, um, departmental solicitors and, and a number of people will look at this and it moves through uh, the normal process of looking at legislation. Um, I think at this point in time, um, it, it is non-controversial in that it's setting out just basically the words that have been used for many years, uh, which in, in, at, at a later date the figures will be will be added to the to, to the piece of legislation in front of you. If we were, if we as a committee were not to agree this today, what effect impact does it have on the process? I, I actually don't know the answer to that, so we'd have to seek advice on that. But I, I would I would find it uh, unusual um, with respect if you didn't agree because it's something that has been used 
over a number of years um, as the piece of legislation. Well, it hasn't been used for the last three years, has it? Yeah. And we are in unusual times. I think one of your colleagues is... Yeah. Yeah. Mr. McAvoy is, uh, is perhaps the expert. Super sub. Sorry, just uh, I've been through this process before Alan took over in terms of the regional uh, rate. Um, part of this, the, um, the political impasse. Um, so this is only seeking permission for the SL1 letter, Subordinate Legislation 1 letter, which is just um, essentially to clear the process through the committee that um, we will be taking forward a regional, it's advance notice that we will be taking forward a regional rates order. This is the policy behind a regional rates order and that um, it's a piece of subordinate legislation goes through the assembly annually to provide uh, for the rate poundage. At the moment, uh, we don't know what the poundage will be, but when the actual legislation is made and brought before the committee, that will have the poundage. But surely, just, to, just allow me to go, like, we're, we, we've been told beforehand that there has been a lot of work that's been done before the budget beforehand, and we were all ready to proceed as soon as we came back and everything was ready to go, but yet we discover we're not, and yet we're being asked to uh, look at this piece of legislation. And we're talking about we don't know what the poundage is going to be set. Can you give us any indication when the poundage is going to be set? Well, at the, at the moment, you're not actually clearing the legislation. It's, you're, you're clearing the subordinate legislation one letter, the SL1 letter, which is basically just a, the, the department uses that to indicate the, the process and the policy behind the process. Um, as Alan has indicated, it's, this has been a process that we've went through in the past with the Finance Committee because because of the tight time scales between uh, the pres presentation of the SL1 letter to say uh, this is the order that we intend to make, but there has always been a dependency on the budget agreement uh, following, following that. Um, say, for example, we wait until there is a budget agreement. Uh, the Minister last week referred to that being uh, before the 11th of, of March. So if we waited for that to provide the SL1 letter to the committee... We're being asked to think, consider accelerated passage anyhow, aren't we? The budget. For the, the budget. Yeah, for the budget. The budget bill is a distinct... Uh, yeah. It's the, yeah, the budget. So in terms of the, the process forward, if we were to present the committee with the SL1 at that point, you would then need to schedule that onto your committee session for the first Wednesday after the, the, that, the 11th of March. Uh, after that, then, uh, if you agreed that, then we would need to come to you with the uh, the following week with the actual statutory rule. As you can see, as you go through the weeks, you're taking further towards the turn turn of year and the bills uh, having to come out. So, pre pre presenting the SL1 to the committee at this point, as has been done in the past, is merely to prevent uh, the uh, expedient process with regards to rate bills issue. It's not actually legislation that we're seeking to be cleared today, it's the SL1 letter, which is the sort of process and the policy behind the legislation. Um, yeah. to, uh, again, to my colleague uh, had asked, uh, what is the impact of a one-week delay on this? I mean, it, it just seems an awful, seems a lot coming through, and as you already said, sure, yeah. this is three years, it's a brand new committee. I would like to have probably at least I've done my best to try and understand this, but I mean, t tell me, what is this impact, uh, Mr. Bronte, on those um, businesses that you haven't met with yet in order? I know it's, I know it's a different level, or, but if you're looking at the monies, or again, I'm just going to go back to you that businesses or households, they're only they're thinking of is what is it, what is the rate, what is it that we're going to pay? So is this a process that in some way that I, I would like to be able to give a little bit better scrutiny to this, if possible. But I'm, I'm not sure why that is. I just can't figure out at this late stage hmm. that, that this, is, this will be the statutory vehicle which will make the figures that um, uh, the Assembly agree to in terms of the regional rate yes. for non-domestic and for capital values and, to, to come into law. Yeah. And will it be common practice to bring it in Six weeks before the budget? Yeah, oh yeah, it's it is. Some practice. Okay, that's. 
Uh, but, but, sir, mm, sir, go ahead. We don't have any draft registration in front of us. Mm -hmm. I've got a letter. Yes, that's a letter. SLO letter, yes. So that's what you're asking us to prove, yes, a letter? just a letter, yes. Oh, right. That's a... Oh. But that's, a, that's part and parcel of the letter, so the coordinate letter. But I have a different question for you. Yeah. As officials, have you recommended a pound each level yeah. to the Minister? Pounds. I was going to ask. And is that part of your function? No, it's part of the function. Uh, it's part of the budget process. We, we may be involved in, in, in looking at that, one, but it'll be a decision which will be reached by the Minister and probably in, it's very much a budget process. Yes, but uh, civil servants give advice. They do, but not you, so not, yep. not you. No. Who is giving the advice? Just for our education. Well, the, the, the branch of uh, the department that deals with the overall budget preparation, which includes the regional rate makes up 5 to 6% of the budget. So they factor that in the balance, and it's uh, Central Expenditure Division and uh, Department of Finance that uh, manage that, that process um, and have managed it in the last three years with, with NIO. Um, so they manage that with the Finance Minister and the Executive to set the, to set the budget. So, but surely they've, oh, they've already done a lot of that work already, I would have thought. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure they have. I mean, we, uh, we uh, obviously have... Uh, our own views on on the poundage, but really the 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 overall amount to be raised through the rating system, we can point to things like high poundage, uh, etc., et and the impact of the poundage on on businesses. But that really is uh, a matter for the minister and his and his uh, the budget staff within the department. It's 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 what 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 do you want to raise from the regional rate, hmm. or what do you need good. to raise? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, so you, what you're asking us here is to approve a letter. Yes, it's the SL one. So, 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 what is the advantage of getting a scrutiny committee to agree a letter mm -hmm. or a process? That's, that's just part of the subordinate legislative process of the of the assembly. Any time the legislation is made in the assembly, the process is that the committee gets an SL one letter. Uh, prior to the to inform them that the department intends to make this piece of legislation, it's really the committee's first sight of things to prepare them for the fact that a bit of legislation will be being made by the department in due course. So, so um, it's only a, a warning letter or yes, a, it's a, a, a courtesy it, it, letter? It's a courtesy letter. If it's a courtesy letter, why do we have to approve it? Pardon? If it's a courtesy letter, why do we have to approve it? Yeah. Well, that, I mean, I, I'm, I would be more than happy for, <laughs> for the process to be dis dispensed with and that it adds... I don't think time. you would be, for the record. <laughs> you wouldn't. Maybe it would be useful at this stage if I just ask the uh, clerk just to sort of go quickly. Yeah, yeah. Quick line. Chair, the, the SL1 letter is, sets out the policy proposals that are going to come to committee in the legislation. It's the committee's opportunity to consider those policy proposals and uh, provide a view on it. Uh, once the statutory rule is produced, the committee can't change it. So as this is an affirmative resolution, SR, the committee will have the opportunity to either recommend it to be, that it be affirmed by the Assembly or to recommend it that it not be affirmed by the Assembly. That's the one with the poundage in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. So the, the, the committee will have another opportunity to look at it with the pound that's in it. However, at that stage, it can either recommend that it be affirmed or recommend that it not be affirmed. So again, uh, my question, which I don't think has been answered, is what impact and effect will it have to the process if this committee does not agree or endorse this SL1? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the subordinate legislation process for government departments is to present the SL1 letter to the, to the committee. Uh, and in the past, we have taken the view that if an SL1 letter isn't clear, that the legislation can't, can't move forward. Is the key word not present? Yes. yes. It's not approved. The key word is to present. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, reason, the regional rate must be set to allow the rate bills to be issued. Mm -hmm. If the regional rate is not set and the order making the regional rate is not passed by the 13th of March, the rate bills can't be issued before the beginning of April. So every week of delay thereafter then delays the issue of the rate bills. In and of itself, not a major problem, except that um, if you get into April and the regional rate order has not yet been set, um, the opportunity for rate payers who habitually pay their rates by direct debit and 10 instalments um, will start to be, become more problematic until eventually it will get to a point where 
rate pairs will not be able to make 10 instalments and the rates will have to be reduced to 9 and then subsequently to 8 and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I'm not suggesting that there's any prospect of a long-term delay of that nature, but if the initiation of the legislation is delayed, which then you know, concertinas the amount of work that we need to do in order to get the bill through, whenever, or the order through whenever the rate is actually set by the executive, um, then that knocks, has a knock-on real-world implication in terms of rate bills going out. And, and of course, things. we faced this disaster whenever the storm fell the first time yes. when the previous minister failed to bring forward a budget mm -hmm. to this place. Uh, we have a new minister now, and we asked last week for his first day brief, and he says, no problem, it's only a few pages long. I've yet to see that first day brief. Now, I believe we have it today. That's a week. So we're in a new place now, and these committees will not take the lack of information that we had received before. And we will be scrutinising everything. Now, I know this is a very simple thing, and I may be being petty on this, right. but I need to send a message. We need to send a message yep. through you guys, because it's not your fault, to the department that we ain't going to stand for any more nonsense. Well, we brought this at the absolute earliest opportunity so to, uh, to give you the, the time to, to consider this. and. Uh, um, as you saw, I was walking away from the table and sure they called me back, so mm -hmm. I wasn't sure whether you wanted this discussion today or not. But we have pushed this through at the absolute earliest opportunity to, to give you the time uh, and to give you the respect in terms of your role as a committee. And can I add that the information we've received from you, Al and Ian, and I'm sorry, I can't. Andrew, and Andrew it's been very, very informative and very, very detailed, and you're top of your game, there's no doubt about mm -hmm. that. But we need to send a message to the department that we're not going to be messed about. Uh, I'm personally not going to be messed about by any department or any minister. Uh, you guys probably have got the brunt of it because you're up first. Types now. <laughs> but, but, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't feel, I certainly don't feel that way at all today huh? with the session. Um, and uh, uh, in, uh, Andrew, who's got vast experience in, in this particular area, provided me with the immediate prompt and the draft, which we then put up through the system uh, to the permanent secretary and, and, and to the minister, and probably one of the very first. Uh, SL1s, I think, from, from the department, and so we have pro proactive, been proactive in actually providing this at the very earliest opportunity. As you would appreciate, we were moving towards uh, pushing uh, towards regional rates in Westminster, uh, and we had already started that process, and we have immediately now started this process of bringing it through this, this House and through this committee, and so we've been proactive in bringing this at the very earliest opportunity. So, uh, uh, I think... Um through the indulgence of the committee, and may I thank you just before we go to it, but just for one message and to reiterate what the, uh, the Deputy Chairman has ably put, is that if you can convey the message back to the Perm Sec, and I'm sure she's listening avidly to every single word she we're is. saying, but we do expect to see information in a timely manner. And there has already been discussions on poundage, and I think it would be more appropriate if, than when that information is available, we were brought early into the conversation rather than later. But thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just have to ask the committee here uh, that I would ask the committee formally to consider the uh, DFP's proposal for subordinate legislation under the rates, brackets, regional rates, order in NI 2016. And there's no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. All those in favour say aye. aye. Any against? Right, sir, number 10. Yep. Yep. Sir, team, we're going to move on to, uh, before we go into the process of reading off all the statutory rules, I would, wouldn't mind bringing in Nick Fan now. So that's item 20 in the on your uh, agendas. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's two minutes. Sorry. Yeah. Come on, if you don't mind, can we have a quick two minute break while everybody has uh, just goes to the bathroom? I apologise profusely. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 
29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Uh, Tim, we're back in live session again. Seamus, uh, first of all, may I start with apologies, and can you pass on our apologies to Esmond? Um, we were discussing rates, as you can imagine, and there was a lot of interest in uh, particularly sort of rateable values and what's happening to our local businesses. So we were using the opportunity while they had up in front of us, and I apologise. Um, I know uh, Esmond personally, so I'll get in contact with them and I'll sort of write to him and just say sorry for any of the time delays. But I think the expression is it's indicative timings, and it was particularly indicative. But thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed in coming to talk to us about fiscal powers, the review of fiscal powers for the Northern Ireland Assembly. And I understand you're not going to have the same detail with Esmond, but Seamus and Jeff, over to you, please. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much, Chair. And, uh, yeah, it, you know, obviously it's unfortunate. Esmond was the actual author of this report uh, back in 2013 when he was uh, Chief Economist at PricewaterhouseCoopers. We never had commissioned the report. And as I said in the brief that we gave you, uh, we had been commissioning a number of reports around that, that time, uh, looking at a range of economic topics. And our approach at the time, I had been a member of the Economic Development Forum representing Nick Van Volderen. Community organisations, the Economic Development Forum had been set up coming out of Strategy 2010. And one of the things that had been looking for is what policy levers uh, made you find that if you adjusted that we might change the trajectory of the economy in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, you'll know that some of the comments in this report were, you know, refers back to uh, not a lot of changes. You know, a lot of, a lot of our development is fairly flat line. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 we have had policies like want to close the gap in terms of productivity between Northern Ireland and other parts of the UK. Uh, but yet that really, really hasn't changed. So. Uh, Economic Development Forum was looking for what things or policies, if you just might make, might make a difference, and that's what we started to do in NICFA and commissioning these reports. So quite often we weren't actually looking to support an argument that we wanted to make, but we're trying to find things out. So back in 2013 we commissioned this report because we had noticed that the uh, Scottish Parliament Welsh Assembly had started to look at, to look at these things. Uh, we commissioned the, this this report, and we think it's a platform on which the assembly can build, uh, if so minded, you know, in terms of uh, the future. Key things that come out of it is that obviously it sets out major and minor taxes. I think the thing about minor taxes is even if you took control of those, uh, the adjustments uh, in terms of financial terms might not make a lot of difference, either up or down. Uh, you know, in terms of the income uh, that is available, you know, for the Northern Ireland Executive. The major ones are, are obviously in VAT, uh, they're in income tax and they're in national insurance. Uh, and there are certain curtailments around those as, as well. I you know Scotland has, has powers to vary and hasn't uh, done that. Uh, so the, it lays out that. It also lays out, I think, a formula for how you would look at uh, the devolution of taxes in terms of whether they're desirable, affordable, useful, and, and things like like that. And uh, we did present the report at the time uh, to the uh, committee, and uh, I'm not sure if any of the members here were present then, but obviously it was received and. 
thought was given to it to it then. So we're happy to take any questions that any of the members want. Esmond is also happy what he, he said on leaving was he's really sorry that he, he couldn't stay, but he has a lecture to give at five, five o'clock. Therefore, that commitment, he would be quite happy to return as well uh, to talk to the committee if you so wished. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Chair. And again, I haven't, uh, forgive me, because I haven't read the report in <coughs> the detail whatsoever. In fact, I've only I've just been able to get my hands uh, on it today, and that's no fault of anyone uh, other than myself um, to get a good read at it. But tell me, seriously, do you really think we can handle further fiscal power in this place? Uh, that certainly was the question, I think, at the time in 2013. And um, to be absolutely truthful, I can tell you, lots of people uh, in the world outside were saying to me, this would be mad, you know, uh, you know, in terms of responsibility for powers. I mean, our, our thought was that we're exploring all the options. There is a strong argument to make that if you have to control taxes, you know, if you have to raise money as well as spend it, uh, that that itself brings a certain discipline, uh, you know, to, to government. Uh, but certainly the question you pose is a big question that is asked, I think, by, uh, by many. I think the hope and expectation is that if you, if you do take on some more of these powers and responsibilities, that it, uh, you know, it strengthens, I think, the or potentially strengthens the responsibility of the Assembly. It's just that when, when you have the levers of power, the urge is to touch them, and, and you will have pressure to raise revenue, pressure and objection if you do, and then the populists among us not wanting to go near it, yet shouting for them in the first place, it, it could be enough to bring this place down again, having too much fiscal power. Uh, is it worth the risk? Uh, I mean, I think it's a, you know, it's a difficult balancing act for all politicians, uh, you know, in terms of how much money you, you can raise off the public, in terms of what they're willing to pay in taxes and how much you spend, you know, in terms of the delivery of services. And I think politicians are the people to, you know, to, to work out where the public stand on that. And I think that if you either tax the public more than they're willing to pay, uh, or if you reduce services more than they want that to happen, if you get either of those things wrong, you've got an angry public who might decide, obviously, to vote for someone else, uh, you know, at, at a future election. So that... I think is the is the big question that rests with you. One of the things I think that we have said a couple of times is that we can't really be running a right wing income policy mm -hmm. and almost a left wing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the line of the year. Well, if, you, if, you, if you think about it, it's the only combination that can't work. You know, the other the others can't, whether you like them or you don't like them. But you can't say we want to spend uh, more, but we want to raise less. Uh, and I think that's the whole issue then of responsibility for politicians in, in government. Do you want me to list out the MLAs that have that trait? <laughs> uh, no, I'm more no, uh, uh, I'm not being flippant because this is a very, very serious matter. Yeah. Uh, my fear is even if we did have the power, uh, uh, for what it's worth, I'm low tax. Uh, I don't believe it's right to take hard earned money off businesses and individuals for government to spend it badly. Uh, we do not have a system here, we have not a system of efficiency or effectiveness in any of our departments in order to get decent fiscal powers, and that's me being completely honest. Uh, do you well, disagree I would say with the, that? Yeah, but what I would say is the report sound on that. The report just talks about where the fiscal powers you know, could lie, uh, but I mean, ultimately, uh, your political judgment in terms of whether you're you know, for for want of a better term, tax and spend, or you, you want to reduce tax and reduce uh, you know resources, is literally a matter then for you, the politician, and the political parties. Yeah, the report just, as I say, talks about yeah, because I can remember being in the company of, of Dr. Esmond Burney. It was a seminar in one of the local hotels close to here. I knew I drove, I drove from here to take part in a panel, and I had explained to the people that it was filled with business. Uh, 
experience in the room and, and I, my statement was well look if you want to go play at services you'll play bullion for it but some of those bars will be missing um, and, and that's basically how I see it at the present time. I will take time to read this report because obviously we're in the finals committee so it would be certainly in my duty to, to do so uh, and I, it seems what I've looked at so far it seems a very well written document and very uh, clear and concise so I will take time to read it uh, and again, thank you very much for answering my questions. Yeah. I wish well, you I wish you well in your proposal to treble the MOT fee to hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very popular this week. Mm. Um, and had we done that, I think we would have been absolutely lambasted. Um, is there not a fundamental danger? I mean, obviously, I welcome the report, and I mean, it's one that's very timely given you know the, the new deal that we've now new decade, new deal that we've agreed to. Um, there's a fundamental issue, mind you. If we uh, give ourselves f uh, money raising powers, and we so you suggest here 400 million, what's to stop the Treasury simply deducting 400 million from the block grant, saying we don't want to give this to them because um, they can raise it themselves? And, and what, what advantage would that be to our community to impose these? You know, you've suggested here water charges. You've suggested that. Um, Retail levy, car parking, increased public transport fees, increased tuition fees. Why would we impose that on our community for no net gain? Mm. The report doesn't actually say that, Jim, in terms of, it, you know, it's not actually saying you should do this. It's saying this is what you could do. Yes, you but know, why, so, would, why, why, why would we think and, of doing it? Yeah, and, you know, you and everyone else and we in NICFA, uh, just because we say you could do something doesn't mean that you actually would. Your question, you know, your reference as well to if there was a 400 million uh, difference about Treasury netting it off is quite right as well. Because at this time, the big discussion in 2013 was the corporation tax issue. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the view that we took on that, and there would have been a lot of pressure in our, in our sector who would have seen it very simply as, oh, you just want to transfer a lot of money to, you know, uh, to big business, you know, in terms of for going the money to the block grant because the block grant would be cut by whatever amount of money that was agreed with Treasury that it was deemed to be losing in cor corporation tax. Uh, I mean, our view was uh, we would be willing to explore it. Uh, that doesn't mean that we think it would be a good idea, uh, you know, to, to, to do that. And this report, you know, does say something ab about that in that if you think how volatile corporation tax is in that... Uh, it doesn't even out year by year. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. companies pay a lot one year, but maybe nothing <coughs> the next. Some of the best, uh, you know, some of the companies with the finest tax departments sometimes pay nothing, <laughs> a lot. You know, and we've all we've all seen that. So yeah, there there's there's very serious judgment issues, and we wouldn't say rush into anything here. And uh, what the report also said is that there's a need for, if you're reminded to do it. Uh, you, you, you would need some more detailed, detailed study, uh, but uh, it is a, a certainly difficult area uh, to move into, and that is, you know, that is no doubt. Well, the value of this report, which was published in 2013, is that actually some of your estimates have been very close to the mark. For instance, you've stipulated that the plastic bag levy would raise four million a year. It's now hidden and has raised about four and a half million a year. So the soothsayers got it right in that sense. Um, and you know, if you increase that to 10 pence, maybe there's a potential of knocking it up to eight or nine million a year, but that's a drop in the, drop in the ocean, really, in, in comparison to, to what we need. The other thing that has happened is that you said tuition fees, you're based on your assumptions, and tuition fees going up from 3,290 to 5,500. In GB, they've actually gone up to 9,000 pounds per annum. Now, um, any attempt to do that in Northern Ireland would be exceptionally unpopular. But the real difficult one here is water charging. Since this was published, they, they attempted to introduce water charging in the Republic of Ireland. And whilst we're a different jurisdiction, it has been fascinating to see what happened there. Even when they implemented the €100 Euro per household charge, it created more political ill will than practically any other decision taken. And that would probably spill across the border to here if we tried it. I remember being hounded down the street in Rafaelin by a gentleman brandishing the indicative water bill that were published about 2007. 
And it was for something like £49. And I thought to myself, the gentleman would drink more in the local hotel that weekend. But it just showed you how emotive it was that he was chasing me down River Island trying to verbally attack me for even this arriving in his front door. And it, the difficulty is, I don't think either of those are deliverable at the moment in the Northern Ireland context. A, because they would be terribly unpopular, and B, there wouldn't be a confidence that we would spend the money correctly. I think North, uh, the Assembly needs to bed down and prove its worth after all of the recent shenanigans that have been going on before people would even accept that. And as Paul said at the last committee meeting, I think we're in the last chance saloon as an Assembly. Not because of the political divide, but because of our lack of capability to run this place properly. So therefore, th you know, thanks for the information, very useful. But I just can't see anything bar a 10p plastic bag tax being deliverable. I mean, I think, I mean, again, what I'm saying is the report says <clears throat> these are the powers you have, these are the things you, you could do, doesn't mean should do, mm. uh, you know, and all of that. There is, a th there is also, as I say, remembering that taxes can be used to influence behaviour, you know, and the one that mm. you put your finger on is absolutely right. Uh, you know, the four million odd pounds extra to revenue in Northern Ireland is not of great consequence. But certainly the change that it made on our behaviours in terms of uh, taking all those single-use plastic bags, uh, you know, I think was, was important. So obviously taxes can do two things. You can look at it from a revenue perspective and you can look at it for uh, how you might shape behaviours. Uh, I think what the report is sort of saying is that uh, there are only some things that might give you a revenue boost if you are minded to do them. And as I say, it's not saying you should do any, any of that. It's trying to lay out, I think, it's trying to lay out what, what the reality is with regard to taxes. You know, so page 36 shows you the revenue that comes in from these individual taxes and you'll see it's near, you know, 3 billion for VAT, 2.5 billion for income tax and 82 billion for national insurance tax. But when you come down to the aggregates levy, it's 6 million, you know, and, uh, you know, right, right, right through uh, you know, the, the others. Yes, I've had a tracked experience of the aggregates levy. Indeed, there's a, there's a quarry recently who was paying £900,000 a year on aggregates levy. A straight tax, because that money is lifted by the HMRC. It goes to South End. It doesn't come anywhere near all now. Mm. And all we get back from that is the Barnett, Barnett consequential of just under 3%. The problem is we pay 12% of the levy and we get about 2.9% of it back. So an advocating an increase in the aggregates levy is only going to work if we can keep our proportion of the levy. And it places quarry owners in a very stark disadvantage because, say they're in Fermanagh or Straban or somewhere, the quarry across the border doesn't have the aggregates levy. It's £2 per tonne. And that puts them at an automatic disadvantage to their competitors who could be five miles down the road. So, again, whilst the report it's a good idea and will reduce <coughs> maybe... 9, 10, 11 million pounds a year. As it's presently structured, not a cent of that comes directly to Northern Ireland. So you'd have to have a major change in the legislation setting it up. And in fact, I've been asking a few questions of the Minister of Finance about how we could do that. But that's not an attractive option if there's a 9% percentage point gap between what we pay and what we get back. Okay. Yeah. Sean. Sure. Thanks. Well, thanks, Seamus. Seamus, you said it at the outset that developments were flat lane. What did you mean by that? Was it the economy here? Or? Yeah, it, it's a flat line development in that, uh, you know, over the years, you certainly looked at, at the period 10 years or more previous to, to this, yeah. uh, you know, the increase in terms of, uh, you know, the economy in Northern Ireland, I can't remember the actual figures, but you're not looking at 1%, you know, so the thing about it, about it is, is can we find something that might begin to change? You know, that would might make the curve go up yeah. and uh, increase income and increase wealth in in Northern Ireland. You know, change uh, because all the economic policies and Esmond is particularly good at this in terms of reviewing all the economic work that has gone before. They've all basically said, uh, here's the things we need to aspire to, but we've actually failed, you know, to yeah. to deliver on them. So we, we need to try and find a better way. 
Yeah, and can we learn lessons from the South of Ireland, which is 5 or 6% growth, salaries, everything is much higher, in other words, it's debt. Debt. No. No. but have much more fiscal powers. But uh, There's always lessons to be learned, you know, good or bad, from, mm. uh, you know, from everywhere else. And particularly, as, as I say, around the whole debate on lower corporation tax. I mean, the argument that was made generally was corporation tax rate in the south is far lower. Uh, and if we go to that, uh, you know, we, we'll get yeah, an improvement. I think a jury's out on, on that one. Yeah. You know, so you have to ask, is there a whole combination of policies uh, yeah. that, that might improve things? And, and that goes, you know, when you're looking at the economy, it goes into education, skills, shortages, all of, all of this. And uh, there's an argument to make about the South that it certainly wasn't, corporate, it wasn't just corporation tax, it was a whole range of other policies as well. Yeah. And just in terms of, and I know Paul said that we shouldn't be restrict our fiscal powers, but we should be arguing for greater fiscal powers, like Scotland, to have them here. It gives us a wider labour. Well, as I say, that is ultimately a matter for you, uh, you know, and as I say, this report was looking at the issue and saying if we devolve more powers on certain taxes, would it be beneficial or not? And one of the things I said in the, in the preface to this at the time was we need to be looking at this not from our politically partisan type of view or anything like that, we need to look at it in the real cost-benefit terms, is would it be useful to devolve this power and could we make something better of it? Mm. You know, yeah. and some people think that yeah, let's. Some people may make an argument to devolve a power because they believe then that we should just cut it. And as I say, that's a bit of a fantasy as well. Like because you have to. I mean, you have in, in terms of government, you have to make ends meet. You know, you have to raise enough money to be able to deliver the services uh, that you want. And again, my view, regardless of whether people are on the left or on the right. The public, their voters, are going to be looking for a balance in there somewhere. You know, they're going to be looking. Because nobody puts their hand up and say, "Please tax me more." Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, if you tax them a lot less and you know reduce all the services, they may not be happy with that either. Mm -hmm. So that's your job then, as I said, to figure that one out. You know, mm -hmm. or obvious. Um, okay, so. uh, sure. chair. Thank yep. you. Oh, right. Very quickly. Um, so isn't there an obvious danger for a region which is so heavily dependent on a £10 billion subvention every year from the Treasury to ask for fiscal powers? Because doesn't it invite the obvious repost? Then you go raise whatever you need. Yes, I think that, uh, you know, that clearly is there. And there's a, there could be a view around. that the Treasury take a poor view of us on a kind of... Uh, you know, our money is spent and, and all, of, all of that. Uh, to make something like that successful, I think an argument has to be made with Treasury that there's a certain investment, you know, that there's an invest you save, uh, and that if we could bring down uh, some of the subvention and Northern Ireland got the benefit of some of that, there's, I think there's an argument. Uh, How many taxpayers have we in Northern Ireland? Uh, I can't answer that question for you, Jim. But because I think, the estate's somewhere I in think, the region of seven hundred thousand. Yeah, and what I recall, I mean, what I do recall from this is, if you were looking at income tax, it would be hard to avoid the lowest uh, bracket income taxpayers because we don't have an awful lot of the highest uh, mm -hmm. bracket ones. But if you average seventy thousand right? on the forty, sorry, I think we have about seventy thousand on the, the forty. On the higher rate. Yeah. Uh, higher rate, but that, that has one of all, like... I so, so in the <coughs> fantasy land of fiscal powers for Stormont, to have to raise the money which comes from the Treasury, you're talking of, I think, on average for every taxpayer, an increased tax bill every year of something between thirteen and £15,000 a year. I don't think the Treasury, even the Treasury, would expect us to do that because, no, as it, we all accept... Uh, any regions of a country, there will always be transfers taking place. So shouldn't we recognise when we're well off 
if we're the one region in the United Kingdom getting the highest subvention, averaging about £11,500 per citizen, uh, wouldn't be we well advised not to meddle? Uh, that's certainly an argument. And uh, I think the argument and the discussion uh, you know, with the UK government and with Treasury is transferring some of these taxes in terms of how they're collected would there be a benefit? Would there be a mutual benefit? Uh, might we become less dependent in any way? Uh, and you know, could we make a reasonable contribution? I think you know, we'd have to have that. You'd have to have that uh, that discussion. And Thank I you. think you'd have to be looking for, as I say, an invest, you know, to save argument. I suppose, uh, I'm inclined to agree with you there, Seamus. In fact, it was very much part and parcel of um, uh, the um, ambitions of the North West region with the uh, Derry City and Stavan District Council area and the Donegal Council, that's where they promote that whole area as a region. Um, identifying maybe some of the elements that, in many ways, uh, affect. Uh, the economy, and particularly even then, too, one, one uh, considers about attracting within your economy, i.e., those people who will be earning at the higher rate and so on. Uh, the medical school being one of them, and that that region would have uh, hoped to, uh, if anything, then uh, be net contributors to the whole economy. But the one distortion that is there, in fact, is the border. And all one has to do is to go right along that whole border area, and all of a sudden it becomes blatantly obvious that that border, not only does it distort relationships with our communities, but also with our economy. Now, irrespective of whether the north of Ireland is part of uh, Northern the Ireland. UK or part of, say, an all-Ireland economy, but once again, too, just as you had alluded to as well, uh, it's going to be considered as a region, and as a region it will depend on central government to be... Uh, uh, subsidising it, uh, but to what extent would central government continue to subsidise? But that in itself shouldn't uh, take away from us uh, in any way maybe our aspirations and becoming much more dependent, we'll say, on our own abilities and on our own strengths. And contrary to, we'll say, some of the opinions expressed here, I would have confidence in our people, and I mean all of our people, and taking decisions for themselves and having the ability to implement uh, fiscal policy to the benefit of all of our people. And I know straight away one would say, well, they could cite situations that whereby there's been clearly an abuse of that role, especially whenever one thinks of RHI and the likes of it. But in so many other respects, we do have that ability. And I think that uh, I would welcome um, more uh, fiscal responsible that's been given to our people, just in the same way too as what uh, I look forward to even this assembly in itself, uh, divulging more uh, power and responsibility to our local councils and there that we'll be able to address many of the local needs and the needs of our communities. Thanks, Commissioner. Well, as I say, the main thing that we were trying to do was investigate would any of, you know, in terms of this report and the other reports, investigate, is there anything that we might, can we throw some light on any of these issues that we might do differently that might improve the economy in Northern Ireland, the economic well-being? And our interest, you know, from community and voluntary organisations' point of view is, uh, you know, to see a place with reduced poverty, to see people having better income, better opportunities, and uh, which I'm sure is common for every, you know, for everyone else. And uh, so, trying to find ways that improve our economic circumstances. And but the report <coughs> does not say go do these things. You know, it doesn't say that. It says it throws some light, uh, you know, on the issue. And then ultimately, it is a matter for the legislature to think about and to <coughs> uh, do something about. And as I say, you cannot do that other than in conjunction with the uh, with Westminster as well. Um, just a, just a, thank you very much indeed. Uh, just a very quick one. I'm sort of conscious that time is marching on. Uh, one of the issues that was raised in the recent uh, agreement, in inverted commas, brackets, not agreement, depending which way you look at it, uh, is the issue of a fiscal council. 
And one of the biggest issues we have in Northern Ireland is we don't have a proper Office for uh, Budget Responsibility. Um, and I know it's something that's been alluded to in some of the discussions that Nick has had in the past, <coughs> and I know it's been part of the work that's been out there as well. Would you like to make a comment about the advisability or otherwise of having a proper fiscal council? I think that would be. I think that would be a good thing. You know, it, it is certainly what has been done. El, you know, elsewhere, and I think one of the other reports that that we had done at one time was to say that we don't gather enough good data in Northern Ireland mm -hmm. to know our circumstances. Quite often, we have relied on the UK data as a whole, and uh, that just doesn't. It's not granular enough, not detailed enough to know how we're doing uh, here in Northern Ireland. So I think. Uh, exploring and examining these things would actually give you and committees like this, uh, you know, a lot more information to make <coughs> them, as I say, sound judgments on. So I think that would be a good thing, sure. Okay, thank you very much. Just, uh, sort of, Sean, just for a couple. Just a quick point, and I know that and just where oh, yeah. I don't know what criteria you had, Seamus, but I think um, it should have been widened out to look at the benefits of an all Ireland economy. Um, and the eco economics of scale there, uh, it's limited to that within strictly within the partition. Um, well, that, yeah. you know, as I said, we were, we were not looking at that, and our only thing was to look at these powers all rest with Westminster, yeah. these fiscal powers. And our only thing was uh, driven by if Scotland are looking at the issue as to seeing where they might devolve some of them to that, we were wanting to do the same thing. And uh, so it, it, it was curtailed in, in that sense, in that it wasn't looking at any other any other issue other than where the powers lay. Okay. Good. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Just to be quick, do, do you think that uh, so you think that this document uh, is still fit, uh, or does it need future proofed in the point of the experiences we've had in three years and the right. fact that we have had a previous finance minister right. wouldn't bring a budget? to the, the floor of the Assembly for seven months simply because it was too hard for him, simply because of political pressures from people for profit in his party's heartlands. All that primitive political stuff, mm. uh, infantile stuff. Uh, do you need to future-proof this document and bring it up to date uh, with all the experiences we've had in the last three years? I asked, I asked, uh, I asked Esmond that question. That was the first question I asked him about the report himself. Esmond uh, believes the report is still pretty valid mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the relationship between any of these taxes has not really changed a lot, and because uh, you know economically we have not changed an awful lot in the, la in the last number of years, regardless of what has happened within Stormont, uh, the numbers don't change that much. So there'd be some change, but not huge. In the way you could come back and say six years have passed, you'd need to go back at it again. It's still valid enough to be a platform. Uh, for you to make a decision as to what you may want to do next, if you wanted to explore the thing, you, I think you do. You know, you, you, you have you have to do that. But it wouldn't be widely, it wouldn't be inaccurate in that sense. Like, oh, thank you. We need, to, we need to sort of drop it pa very quickly. Sorry, but just where just, where, quite just thinking of time. I find that fascinating and good way to But Mr. Chair, Chair, I'm, 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 uh, the private sector. Uh, uh, you started off by wages and. You know the economy and how it grows with that. There is there a way of rebalancing this? Is set against? I mean, any of those powers that may come to us, can we rebalance that private sector as against the public? Well, that is always, that's always been a key objective yes. uh, of all the economic strategies yeah. that I can ever recall of trying to rebalance the economy. Uh, you know, you 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 will recall. I think it was David Cameron who said, you know. Uh, the Northern Ireland economy looked more like East Germany, you know, than uh, than anything else, because it's about I think it's about 66 percent of yeah. the economy is dominated by the pub public sector. Uh, I think there's no one who who would want to re rebalance that, and we need to grow uh, the private the private sector. And obviously, there's been quite a number of local indigenous companies who have done exceptionally well, like First Derivatives and, and the like, but we definitely need to uh, to be able to grow that, to have a better, more sustainable economy. And have you looked and have you looked at maybe some of that public sector or retraining within the Lisa, private sector? Lisa, I'll give you one. That's my last one. The only past comment we've made on that 
simply privatising things will not change no, the nature of the, yeah. of the economy. All you've done is move it from one place to another. Mm -hmm. It has to be about uh, it has to be about finding ways to help and encourage a new expanding private sector. I think. Okay. Sorry, what was it? Quick. And just quickly, uh, economic modelling. You know, uh, in the light of uh, Brexit and the mm. situation we find ourselves in now, uh, clearly we're in a very different position than Scotland, uh, and that will be dependent on incomes not only, we'll say, from Westminster, but also continuing to receive incomes and that are an influence on our economy from uh, mainland Europe. Uh, that I, I thought it would appropriate that maybe we should have a revision of this report. Okay. Uh, Seamus, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. And I'll I'll write to Edmund and I'll get in contact with him directly and the rest of it. But thank you very much indeed. Okay. And thank you very thank much you indeed for thank coming. You thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's um, speed reading time where I have to read these SRs. Are we ready? Okay. Uh, if we move to agenda item five at page 264, SR 2017-72. If you're content, I'll leave out the pages and the agenda items we go through. The rate small business hereditament relief amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2017. Any comments, team? Uh, the committee has considered uh, SR 2017-72, the rate small business hereditament relief Brackets Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2017 and has no objections to this rule. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Any against? No. Uh, Statutory Rule 2017-184, the Rate Relief Regulations Northern Ireland 2017. Any comments? If content, the Committee has considered SR 2017-184, Rate Relief of Regulations Northern Ireland 2017 has no objection. All those in favour say aye. aye. Any against? A statutory rule 2017-231, rates on occupied hereditament amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2017. Any comments? The committee has considered standing rule 2017-231, the rates on copied uh, on <laughs> on occupied, not on copulated, <laughs> according to here. Uh, hereditament <laughs> amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2017 and has no objection. All those in favour say aye. Uh, Any against? <laughs> I might step down from the chair, you might have this in a second, you know, be careful. Right, Standing Rule 2018-61, Rate Small Business Redmond Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2018. Are we content? The committee has considered 2018-61, Rate Small Business Redmond Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2018. All those in favour say aye. Uh, standing Rule 2018-67, the valuation telecommunications, natural gas and water, brackets amendment, regulations, brackets Northern Ireland 2018. Any comments? The committee has considered Statutory Rule 2018-67, the valuation telecommunications, natural gas and water amendment, regulations Northern Ireland 2018. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Uh, statutory Rule 2018-6018, the NAV list, time of valuation order, Northern Ireland 2018. Uh, and I advise the members the examiner of statutory rule has indicated this statutory will be reported without comment in a report, which will be issue, issued on Friday the 7th. Yes, sir. Okay. Are we content? The committee has considered Statute Rule 2018-68, the new NAV list, time of valuation order, Northern Ireland 2018. And as subject to the examiner of statutory rules, we have no objection. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And against? No. Statutory Rule 2018-109, Rate Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2018. Uh, any comments? Uh, the committee has considered Statutory Rule 2018-109, the Rate Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2018. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Any against? Statute Rule 2019-44, the Rate Small Business Redemant Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019. Any comments? No. Uh, the Committee has considered Statute Rule 2019-44, the Rate Small Business Redemant Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019. And there's no objections. All those in favour say aye. Uh -huh. Any against? Uh, Statute Rule 2019-198, Valuation Telecommunications Natural Gas and Water Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019. Any comments? Uh, the committee has considered Statute Rule 2019-198, the Valuation Telecommunications Natural Gas and Water Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019. All those in favour say aye. 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 Any against? No. 
Statute Road 2025, the rates, making and levying different rates, regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Comments? Sure. Can I ask, Chair, is that the one we've just talked about too? I just want to see the 2020. No, that was the SL, the rates, regional rates are. I think it was, wasn't it? Oh, sorry, the SL. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was the yeah, SL. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay, got you now. Uh, the committee has considered uh, Statute Road 2025, the rates making and levying in different rates, regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. There's no objections to the rule. All those in favour say aye. 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 Any against? I'd like to draw mention's attention to the reference in the Department's briefing paper on page 258, a number of Acts of Parliament. Uh, to advance legislation required to implement the regional rate poundage for 2017-18, 2018-19 and 2019-20 in the rating years. These were deemed necessary because in the absence of a functioning assembly, no regional rate would have been made otherwise. Just to be clear, that's to set, because that is going back to set the process that we're at, at that point. Are we content? Okay. So that's retrospectively. That's then? retrospectively. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are we content to note? Yeah. yeah. Content. Yeah. We'll make sure we note that. Additional statutory rules. Remind members of the meeting of the 22nd of January, the committee agreed to consider the remaining outstanding statutory rules. Uh, drawing attention to the clerk's paper at page 356. The following statutory rules that cover agenda items 15 to 18 and can be found from page 358 onwards. These rules are subject to assembly negative resolution. And inform the members in the report of the examiner of statutory rules to the assembly and appropriate committees first report of session 2019 to 20 3rd of february 2020 has no issues to raise with the technical issue of the following rules uh, sr 2018-94 the whole of government accounts designation of bodies order northern ireland 2018 any comments the committee has considered statutory rule 2018-94, the whole of government accounts, designation of bodies, order in Northern Ireland 2018, and has no objection to the rule. All those in favour say aye. aye. Any against? If we look at 20, statutory rule 2018-130, the whole of government accounts, designation of bodies number two, order in Northern Ireland 2018. Any comments? The committee has considered statutory rule 2018-130, the whole of government accounts, designation of bodies, and number two order in Northern Ireland 2018, and has no objections to the rule. All those in favour say aye. 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 Any against? No. Statutory rule 2019-95, the whole of government accounts, designation of bodies, order in Northern Ireland 2019. Any comments? The committee has considered statutory rule 2019-95, the whole of government accounts, designation of bodies, order in Northern Ireland 2019, and, has no, and we have no objections to the rules. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Any against? Uh, statutory rule 2019-76, the energy performance of building certificate and inspections amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2019. Have we seen that one? No, I don't think so. Not 2019, Chair. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any comments? Uh, the committee has considered standing rule 2019 the energy performance of building certificates and inspections amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2019. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Any against? SL1 we have covered. Uh, we move on. Item 21. Uh, item 21. Item 21 correspondence. Uh, and for members, there's an overview of correspondence received at page 401 of the papers. Uh, there's a letter to the Northern Ireland Executive reference Mental Health. Any comments? Uh, an open invitation to the Minister of Finance to visit Catalyst. Any comments? And acknowledgement of the committee's request for an informal confidential briefing from the MCA at page 34 of the table papers. Could we just turn to table? <coughs> to papers, just so we're content with what we've been, uh, the NCA have responded us with. Table papers, sir. You said yes. Nope. It's, it's page, page three and four of the table papers. The, Paul, these ones here. Yep. Can you have them? Yeah. 
so they haven't yet told us if they're going to come. No. no. That's how I understand that's right, Jim. Mm -hmm. Yes, Chair, it's just a holding reply. Okay. Uh, it's dated the 31st of January, and they said they would respond early next week, but no response has been received yet. Okay. Are we content to note? Okay. Uh, inform members that page five of table papers is correspondence from Jim Allister, MLA, to the chairperson of the committee of the Executive Office Committee regarding the functioning of the Government Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, which passed first stage in the Assembly on Monday past. Jim, would you just like to brief us? Yeah, understanding orders, uh, it's normal. Uh, well, sorry, if the bill gets past second stage, it then goes to a scrutiny committee. Standing orders say that where there is more than one committee that might have an interest, in respect of this bill, the two potential committees are the executive office, because of matters touching upon ministerial involvement, mm -hmm. and the finance department, because of matters touching upon civil service, including SPAD involvement. So standing orders provide that in those circumstances, the two respective chairmen should seek to agree between themselves as to which committee would be the committee to scrutinise it. Hence my letter to the two respective chairs, drawing their attention to that and asking them to make a decision in that respect. And uh, thereafter then the matter would, if it gets past second stage, would go to that selected committee. I've offered in the meantime to go to either or both committees which is a normal practice before second stage, just to inform the committee and present about the bill. We can turn. Members are going to note. So no decisions made yet on that. members. Oh, that's right. Uh, where was? I? Oh, sorry. Uh, arrangements are being made for the two chairpersons to meet to consider and agree under Standing Order 64. Right. Matters of joint concern: how the committee stage of the bill should be handled, if, uh, should it pass the second stage. <coughs> If you're content, I will meet with the chair of the executive committee and go to that point. Are we content? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'd like to draw attention to members of the list of circulated papers for information. That's page 429. I'm asking you're content to note. And I'd like to move on to chairperson's business. Nothing. Oh, sorry, nothing. And then move on to the draft forward work programme on 23. Um, at this stage, I have to, uh, I have another meeting at uh, half five. Could I ask the deputy chairman to take the, take the chair at this position when he gets out from underneath <laughs> the table? And Heidi, if you would be so kind, if you're content. Okay, uh, members, uh, we're on number 23, draft for work programme. Can I just raise uh, the issue that we had talked about earlier, and that was uh, the research paper uh, of the research call regarding to the examples uh, in Wales and Scotland with regards to the financial transactions and how they were able to... Uh, how they were able to gain success in drawing that money down uh, in different aspects. Uh, that was one piece of research, if we could ask that that would be uh, obtained. Agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll just go down through this brief here then. Can I draw members' attention to the updated draft for the work programme on page 434? The clerk has included a reference to the function of Government Miscellaneous Provisions Bill on the 12th of February as it passed first stage on Monday. 
I advise members the Department has indicated that officials will be in a position to provide an update to members on the Budget Bill and Spring Supplementary Estimates when officials from Public Spending Directorate attend on the 19th of February. The Department has also advised that relevant papers should be available for tabling at next week's meeting. Uh, could I seek agreement if members are content to add the 2019-2020 the Spring Supplementary Estimates and Budget Bill Northern Ireland 2020 as a substantive item to the agenda for next week's meeting on the understanding that papers for this item will be included in table papers rather than in meeting packs? Are members content? Yep. Uh, can I advise members, uh, department, uh, departments and arm length bodies have already provided central expenditure division with details of their resource requirements for the coming financial year, and therefore departments should be in a position to engage with their statutory committees and to furnish committees with this information without delay. Uh, can I seek agreement if members are content to write to statutory committees, suggesting that they engage with departments in relation to resource requirements, and that the Department of Finance should provide details of its resource requirements to the committee for consideration at the committee meeting on the 19th of February? Agreed. I, I'd raise the issue of getting the supply officers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which would dovetail with that. <coughs> yeah, I think that's a, a good idea. Yeah. When are we getting that? It hasn't been scheduled yet, uh, Chair. But yeah. I'll uh, progress that with just. Okay. Uh, can I also then seek agreement if members are content with the forward work programme as amended then? Yeah. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, Item number 24, any other business? Can I just raise, uh, can I ask uh, Jim the Clerk if, if there are any outstanding requests from the department that are not yet with us? I know I talked about the first day brief for the Minister. I believe we have that today, though the members don't have sight of it. Uh, is there any other outstanding? Chair, uh, there are no outstanding uh, matters which aren't within the normal uh, deadlines. That they're all within. Uh, it has been agreed that once the, the department gets uh, a request from the committee, it has 10 days to respond and provide a response. So uh, there's nothing beyond the 10 days at this stage. Are members uh, content with that? Any other members want to raise any issues? Yes, Chair. Uh, could I raise the issue that the Chairman alluded to at the beginning? And he said we could come back to it, namely the conduct and behaviour of the Minister whom this committee shadows. Uh, I think uh, the Quinn family uh, have rightly raised the profile on this appalling issue. I think the Minister's behaviour has been everything that the Quinn's, the Quinn's family behaviour has been are excellent, courageous, tenacious everything that the Minister's approach hasn't been. And I would like to propose that as a committee, since we are the shadowing committee of that department, that we write to the Quinn family, that we convey to them our sympathy on their loss, that we commend their courage in their pursuit of justice and truth in this matter, and that we convey our dismay and condemnation of the Minister's behaviour in respect of <coughs> the Quinn family. Okay, members, you've heard that proposal. Jim, is yes. this on the same uh, mission? I'll oh, take your, you then before we go to... I'd, I'd, I'd obviously accept the proposal and support it strongly. Um, it's a, a, a unfortunate that this issue arose after the hearing we had with the Minister last week, because many of us would have been very keen to speak to him about it. Because I think this whole issue goes to the very core of our understanding and trust of the Minister. The Minister, in reference to Paul Quinn, said Paul Quinn was involved in smuggling and criminality. I think everyone accepts that. It was said a month after the dreadful killing of Mr Quinn, when every bone in Mr Quinn's body was broken by those who assaulted him. There's not a word of truth in those allegations, but even if there were, what right did anyone to punish someone by breaking every bone in their body and leaving him almost unrecognisable. So our minister denied that he had ever said that, and had the BBC not been fastidious and were able to dig out the interview where he actually did say that, it may have gone unnoticed, but certainly not unnoticed to the Quinn family. 
I think it's a bizarre situation that we in Northern Ireland are sitting having this type of discussion about our minister. Mm -hmm. In any other democracy, anywhere else in the world, he would have been gone long ago and he yep. certainly would never have got to where he is today. I think the fact that there was an initial denial of this would indicate to me that he's, he's not trustworthy. Uh, he needs to, to apologise to all concerned. He needs to apologise to the Quinn family. And I frankly don't believe he's fit for office. Now, we can, it is a, a Sinn Féin call, the Minister of Finance, so whilst we can't dictate, uh, we, we can't dictate which party gets this office, I am sure there are people within that party who could take it, uh, who wouldn't uh, try and deceive the public in such a gross way. Uh, and I think it's very, very unfortunate what's happened. I know that uh, three years ago there was demands for heads to roll over boilers. This is much more fundamental than boilers. This is the murder of an innocent young man of 21 who was treated in a savage way. And certainly the minister's reaction to it has been extremely callous, to put it mildly. He should be gone by now. Sure. Any other comments? Just one. Um, I also think that we should, you know, the minister himself should give the names of those people he spoke with yep. to our PSNI and to the Garda. Yep. Any other comments? Yes, I'd like to comment this to the chair just uh, that um, uh, Minister Morphy uh, has come out very, very clearly today and has offered his uh, deepest nice. apologies. Uh, and the statement that he had made 13 years ago, uh, that he had no intention to offend uh, the family or anything else, but grievous harm and hurt was done. He recognised and accepted that. And in his apology on that today, he also uh, has offered uh, to meet with the Quinn family. And uh, hopefully uh, that uh, the Quinn family themselves will uh, accept that offer as well too. Uh, and, and the <coughs> proposal by uh, Mr Alistair uh, that when in his proposal he wishes to send a letter of condolence that to the Quinn family, I have absolutely no difficulty whatsoever with that in any respect, but that when he goes on then to uh, condemn the minister at the same time, or an application even then by Mr Wells, that in some way that as if the minister was in some way responsible. Uh, then uh, quite clearly uh, I cannot associate myself with that, not in any respect, nor can any member of my party either associate themselves with that. Uh, I think that the Minister has done the honourable thing. He has come out very, very clearly today and has stated uh, that uh, he offers his deepest apologies now to the family and has offered as well to, to meet with the Quinn family. As I would as well to to the Quinn family would express our condolences that once again this has actually been brought to the fore and I'm sure it's having such an impact on that on them in every respect. Thanks. Sure, sure, could I say there's nothing honourable about apologising under duress, under the duress of the exposure of the Quinn family and the looming election in the Irish Republic. Right. And if there is sincerity, then it'll be matched by giving to the police authorities the names of the illegal persons he met to discuss this murder. That maybe is the greater litmus test. But as Mr. Wells said, it's patently obvious, this is a man not fit for office. That's the view I have and some others. But I do think that it is wholly appropriate that we write in the terms I've suggested, conveying our sympathy, commending them for their courage and tenacity, and yes, conveying our dismay and condemnation of how the minister conducted himself. I push that to the vote if I can. Uh, thank everyone for their contributions to this. Can I add to that uh, proposal, Jim? Yep. Uh, if I be, if I may, that we write to the minister uh, also with this committee's concerns around the minister's error of judgment in this matter, uh, asking him, uh, asking him for his explanation as to why he said it but then also why he concealed it uh, all these years and why it has taken him so long to come to this position uh, when he could have apologised forthwith straight away 
after, after saying what he did. Let's make no mistake, we can all say things wrongly. Uh, but to impact and to create that period of time where there was great angst and hurt, I think, is unforgivable. And also, when we write to Minister, uh, that we question uh, his fitness for office. Uh, because we are in dilemma with regards to scrutiny. Uh, how can we scrutinise uh, a department with a minister at its head uh, that has concealed basically the truth over these years? Would that be appropriate? To well, you? I think it, I think it should be a separate proposal because obviously okay. one's a letter to the Quins and the other be a letter to the minister. I'm content with the principle of both. Okay. Try not to, to but I also have to uh, listening this morning to. Mrs. Breach, um, mm -hmm. uh, when the mother of young Paul this morning, I just found it a harrowing experience, yeah. and I I don't know, I'm, I mean I don't know myself how I could ever try <coughs> to react with that or the death of the son, but I do have to say that uh, I, I think the bravery and being able to go in and to speak like that uh, shows. That there is a concern out there. There's a concern definitely shared from the SDLP towards that. And uh, my own colleague has expressed to me and has come to me just in my building and told me just how brave that Quinn family, the residing Quinn family are. And I need to just put that on record today, Chair. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, if there's no more comments, I want to, I'll put Jim's. Uh, you want to come in? Sir, Chair, can I, can I yep. capture the proposal first? Because uh, Everyone will say so quickly. So the proposal is to write to the Quinn family, yes. uh, conveying this committee's sympathy. Yes. Uh, to commend their bravery. Commending their courage and their courage. Commending the family for their courage. Yeah. And conveying our dismay and condemnation of the minister's behaviour. Um, our dismay at and our condemnation of. Conveying the committee's dismay and condemnation. Of the minister's behaviour. The minister's behavior. <coughs> right, so, just we can read that back here. The yeah, yeah. uh, pro proposal is to write to the Quinn family, conveying the committee's sympathy, con uh, commending them, commending them for courage. their courage and tenacity, and conveying the committee's dismay and condemnation of the minister's behaviour. No. Are there any Sean, you yes. I, I think my colleague said there we don't have any uh, difficulty with the first part of that um, suggestion. As he said, uh, Connor has regretted and withdrawn the remarks today and apologised. Um, I think the, the content of the letter should be the first section of it. Um, and not getting in, that's a different matter, getting into a uh, combination of the minister at this stage. I think we should leave it at that as a committee, um, the first section of that. So is that a kind of no. proposal? That a kind of proposal? Yeah. Can, yeah. can you ask, just, just to add on that, is there, is there a clear definition as to what was first part and second part? Yeah, yeah well, uh, clarity to read, read out. Yes, the, the proposal to write to the Quinn family, conveying the committee's sympathy, uh, commending them for their courage and tenacity. Yeah, yeah. I say, and in seeking justice for their son, you know. And, and what the the bit then you want omitted is just for clarity, Jim. If you could read out the bit that. The uh, and on. the the bit the bit is conveying the committee's uh, dismay and condemnation of the minister. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you all have to keep us right, uh, Jim. The proposal first, or kind of amendment first. Amendment first. So, the amendment first, then. Can we have a recorded vote? Oh, yes, Chair. Uh, our okay, chair so will be recorded. Well, yeah. well, on that first, um, on the amendment, on that vote, is there a way to, to put into that that we call upon the Minister to go forward to the police and, and the Garda to give forward river names of the people that he met with? 
I think the problem with that is a letter to the Quinn family. Got you, yeah. I understand. Yeah. We, we, we could add, a, add, add that into the minister's, the minister's letter. letter. Yeah, yes. yeah, I think that would go into the minister's letter. Yeah. Uh, so the, the amendment, first I'm going to put the amendment to the meeting. Is everyone clear on what we're voting for? So it's the amended proposal with regards to omitting the, the last the third section yeah. of the letters to the Quinn family. I'm trying to be careful here because what we don't want to do is impact yeah. greater pain on the Quinn family. Yeah. Uh, so I'm putting that to the meeting or to the committee, uh, the amended proposal. All those in favour, raise their hand, please. All those against, raise their hand, please. So that's four, that's three, four, and four against. So I put then the uh, proposal that we write to the Quinn family in the terms outlined by Jim. Uh, all vote uh, in the usual manner, please. All against. So that's four, four, three against. That went off, Jim. Yes, sir. Okay, that's agreed then that that letter goes to the Quinn family. Um, can I just say that this? Can I just say, as chair, this has been dealt with quite uh, amiably at this present time, which is good. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm thankful for that, chairing it. Can I then put my proposal to the committee that we write to the minister, asking for an explanation as to why he said, uttered the words that he did at the time why he felt the need to conceal what he had said for all those years. Well, not only did he conceal them, Mr Chairman, he actually denied he'd ever said them. Yeah, he yeah. said they were totally without foundation. Yeah, yeah. And, OK, denied it. Sorry, Chair, can I... Um, so, right to the Minister... Uh, asking for an explanation as to why he uttered the words at the time of the murder. Why he then concealed and denied the comments all these years. Mm -hmm. Stating that this now puts his position uh, for fitness uh, for office uh, in question. And then also ask him to report, as, as Pat has said, report and give all information to the PSNI and Garda uh, uh, that he would know on this murder, this crime, and all other subsequently, all other subsequent uh, information uh, from that incident, including. The, sorry, sorry. Sorry. And keep me, keep me right, Pat, if there's a, something I say that's not uh, in the spirit of your request. Sorry, I regard it, that he knows in relation to this crime. And all our subsequent conversations and meetings that he, have, he has had yep. in connection to this crime. Good. All conversations. Chair, if I can just read this back. Yeah, uh, to write to the Minister asking for an explanation as to why he uttered the words at the time of the murder, why he then concealed and denied the comments all those years, stating that this now puts his position for fitness for office in question and asking him to report and give information to the PSNI and Garda that he knows in relation to this crime and all other subsequent conversations and meetings that he has had in connection to this crime. Members content uh, that I put that? Yeah. No, um, we're not content with that. I think that the Minister today has explained sufficiently 
um, his position. I think we have been in here for a couple of hours and it has developed and I think he has explained uh, his position clearly and I don't think that is uh, necessary. Well, unfortunately, he hasn't explained why he hid it for 13 years and then denied publicly and the media had ever made it and then only admitted it made the comments when the BBC dug it out of the archives. So that doesn't instill any confidence in his truthfulness. I, I don't really want to get into a debate on this that would impact on the family. I'll bring you in and then we'll try and keep it as close uh, as... Yep, certainly. Yep, come on, Henry. Uh, just to make a comment on as well, too, uh, that I think that uh, initially this started off as one one wanted to invite the minister along here uh, to uh, question him about uh, his position in that. And that it has developed into uh, like an epistle condemning the minister in every respect, and that uh, I think that that's totally absolutely unfortunate. And even sort of whenever one uses the language such as conceal, and it isn't the case that the minister has concealed anything at all here, because from the very outset uh, he was very public in anything that he did say. So what I think that uh, Mr. Wells is alluding to is that when uh, the question was put to uh, the head of our party. Uh, that uh, the recollection uh, in terms of her recollection of what it was that Conor Murphy had said or what he hadn't said uh, wasn't correct. She admitted that herself. But it wasn't as if to say that this no, question... Murphy said he didn't say it. It wasn't, that that this, it, wasn't, it wasn't as if to say that this question was put to Conor Murphy. It was. Yeah. Uh, now, now, what I do think is that instead of having this... Uh, a pistol of allegations in the, in, in the sense that if one wants to ask the minister along, ask the minister along, but I think of what in fact one mm -hmm. has there that no way at all again too could I support any of that because I think it was been very, very presumptuous there in every respect and sending a letter of that nature will say to the minister. And I'd have to say too just that uh, since he has come into office and as he ably displayed here only last week very, very capable, and we're very, very fortunate to have a minister of that standard as well, too, in finance. We're so lucky in so many respects. Pat? Just to state from as it developed last night, just on, on the debate, and as I watched the president of Sinn Féin, she was very forthright in her condemnation of, that, of, of yeah. that. So anything which we have said here or voted on here or that letter is a follow-through from what I listened to from the President of Sinn Féin last night. And that's why I will be supporting that we do write this letter to the Minister. And I will take in mind that for, the, for he is an able, I have no doubt that he's an able-bodied Minister and would have been great at the job. But look, there has been a terrible crime committed here. There is a family still grieving for this, and there has been a delay in order in making that apology. And for that, I have to say, I myself feel that I have to support this motion as given here in Ireland. Yeah, uh, uh, Sean, uh, yeah, well, I'm trying to draw this to a close yeah. now, to, uh, so I don't I'm not impact. Just those. a point I want to make in relation to Pat. Nobody's denying that, Pat. Right. Um, and Connor has agreed to meet the family, the Quinn family, and I think issues that they want to raise with him, when, if and when that takes place, I think that is the forum for it. Uh, I think we should not be impacting on the family anymore coming from this meeting. Can I, just add, can I just add as chair, uh, as acting chair, that uh, we have a duty uh, to scrutinise the department and the minister. Uh, we have also a duty to support the Minister and the Department going forward. It would be very, very hard for this committee to support the Department and the Minister with so many doubts uh, and so much of this still open. Uh, and I think it would be remiss of this committee if we did not try and make an effort to get to the truth and by way of, of an explanation from the Minister, uh, as I have proposed here today, uh, I think would be really remiss of this and, and a lack of duty if this, finance minister, if this finance committee walked out of here today without this action being taken. Okay. Um, so I'm going to draw it to a close. I'm going to put it to a vote. So all in favour of the proposal, vote in the usual way, please, by raising your hands. Four. Against. Three. Uh, members, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the, the candid nature of this debate. Uh, it is very impactful. Is there any other business? Uh, one thing, um, again, 
Dr. Horn, uh, Deputy Chair, um, I have a, my sister's young son, my nephew, 42, died in Wales, and uh, it takes a while for that to be all organised. So it's organised for the 19th. It means that I have to fly out on the 19th. Um, so I'm making an apology to it now that I won't be there on the 19th if that comes around. So yeah, we wish okay. you your own, on our thoughts and prayers, Pat, you and your family. Yeah, that's just Thank you. Uh, date and time of next meeting then. Can I inform members that next meeting will be on Wednesday, the 12th of February at 2 p.m. in room 29. Okay, members, thank you very much for your attendance. Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.